Good morning, everyone. First off, we've had a few of us had a little chance to chit chat about um, weather. We haven't seen rain for so long. Um, but we should take a roll call to confirm that all five of us are here. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning. I'm here. Commissioner O'Brien. Yeah, I'm here. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Sunika. Good morning, everybody. I'm here. Commissioner Stebbins. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. Five uh, of us are all set to proceed. A reminder that today we'll conduct <clears throat> this meeting using uh, virtual uh, connectivity. Governor issued an executive director that provided some relief from open meeting law provisions that has allowed us to connect this way since March. So um, we'll proceed in this fashion if for any reason there's disruption today, please go to the MGC website and we'll give further instruction. Thank you so much. And we'll proceed call to order today, September 30th, everyone. And it is public meeting 321. It's 9.02. We'll get started um, today. Um, Karen, we'll, you'll lead it off and then we'll be of yes. course going to Joe. Thank you so much. Right. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, welcome to the meeting today. Uh, this is a big day. This is uh, a vote on the PPC license renewal. I do want to thank the team for all the work that has been done. Uh, we don't come here today without months and months of work uh, by not only our team, but also by the PPC team that provided a lot of information and documentation uh, to the Gaming Commission in order to get to this point where we're at uh, an area we can vote on the license renewal. I would especially like to thank Joe Delaney, who took the lead on this entire renewal process. He did a tremendous job. I'm very grateful. I know that the team is very grateful that he stepped up in this capacity. Uh, and I'm so pleased with uh, how he was able to work with both the licensees and the staff. And I just want to give a big thank you to Joe. So thank you, Joe, for all the work on this. Uh, we also have uh, several members of our team here at the MGC that are going to testify here this morning about uh, PPC and the appropriateness of the license renewal. So I want to thank them. That's Loretta Lilios, uh, Bruce Band, Andrew Steffen, Captain Brian Connors, Derek Lennon, Todd Grossman, Dr. Alex Lightbaum, Katrina Gagrup Gomes, Jill Griffin, Crystal Howard, and Mark Vanderlinden. So all of these people and their teams uh, have been working for months to get this information together. So I want to thank them. There's a lot of renewal process um, meetings, uh, document review, and all of that. So uh, I would want to acknowledge their work on that and uh, the presentations that uh, are going to be uh, in front of you this morning. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. He's going to act as sort of the coordinator, the MC, if you will, amongst all the folks that are going to be presenting and testifying, including not only our staff, but also members of uh, PPC and Penn National. Thank you very much. And Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Um, so what I'd like to start off with here is just to take a few minutes and go over the whole license renewal process, uh, just so everyone understands how we got uh, to where we are today. Uh, so Mass General Law 23K says surprisingly little about license renewal. It only states that the commission needs to establish renewal procedures and that, that the commission set a renewal fee of not less than $100,000. So at a meeting back in February, the commission um, established uh, those procedures and the renewal fee uh, at that time. So these procedures were sent to the licensee in the form of a letter dated February uh, 28th, 2020, which was uh, the basis of our reviews uh, here today. So the procedures established a timeline that envisioned awarding the license uh, before the 6-24-20 expiration date, June 24th. Um, now, of course, due to COVID, the closure of the casinos and the furloughing of casino staff, um, we determined really that meeting that schedule would, would be unrealistic. So from the time of the closure of Plain Ridge in March through early June, uh, PPC staff 
uh, pulled together all of the application information that was set forth in that February 28 letter and submitted that to us uh, through that whole time period. So in June, the commission voted to accept uh, PPC's application as timely and sufficient. And in doing so, under Mass General Law Chapter 38, Section 13, the license uh, did not expire or hasn't expired until the commission makes a final uh, determination on the license. So what that did was that allowed us to uh, perform the necessary relicensing activities really in a more organized fashion uh, that allowed the casino to reopen and then we were able to take on these licensing activities. So essentially there were four main pieces to this renewal process. Uh, the first was accepting the application from the licensee, which we did back in June. The second step was performing the necessary suitability reviews. Um, these were done in late July uh, by IEB uh, at a commission meeting uh, in late July. And which, so they presented a lot of information on PPC's performance in the last five years. And some of what you'll hear today, uh, you may have already heard on that meeting back in July. Um, as part of that, that suitability review. And then the third piece of it was holding a public hearing to obtain input from legislators and the host and surrounding communities, the impacted live entertainment venues, and the general public. That meeting was held on September 16th and uh, <coughs> was well attended. Over 20 people provided either written or verbal uh, testimony um, as part of that hearing. And notably, uh, none were in opposition to the relicensing, which was great. And fourth is uh, today, the public commission meeting to deliberate on the reissuance of the category two license. So the way things are going to go today um, is first, the commission will hear testimony from MGC staff uh, regarding PPC's compliance over the last five years. And as Karen said, I'll act as kind of MC on that and introduce each, uh, each uh, person who's uh, presenting. So then after each presentation, we'll open it up for questions from the commission. Um, and then also in addition to our staff, there's uh, a whole bunch of folks here from PPC who are also available to answer questions should, um, should we need any backup uh, on, on those questions. So then at the conclusion of the testimony and the questions, we, in, we plan on walking through the proposed uh, license conditions. And um, after that, uh, while it's not showing on our uh, agenda, we will get a, a, an update uh, from uh, PPC. And then at that point, uh, the commission can feel free to vote on the application. So um, any questions at all with the process? Okay, none appearing. Um, so at that point, I'm gonna turn this over to Loretta Lilios, um, our interim IEB director, um, and she's going to introduce uh, her folks, uh, the gaming agents and the gaming enforcement unit who'll do the first couple of presentations. So with that, Loretta. Oh, Loretta, you're on mute. Good morning. Okay. It has to happen thank, once. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. I apologize, but good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I am uh, here today virtually with Assistant Director Bruce Band and Senior Supervisor at PPC, uh, Andrew Steffen, and I am in the office today. Kathy Connors uh, is also here. Uh, he is having some issues uh, getting onto this meeting, so he may uh, come into my office. Uh, and address you later, uh, but we are here to offer testimony relevant to the renewal. Uh, before launching into the substance of the IEB's testimony, I did want to just expand on uh, what Joe mentioned and take a moment to remind all that the suitability portion of PPC's relicensing application was recently completed and that you issued a determination of suitability on July 30th. And as part of that review, uh, the IB performed the required background reviews of the corporate entity and individual qualifiers related to this licensee. And we summarized the suitability reports and in our presentation at a commission meeting on, on July 30th, PPC's history of compliance 
with the gaming regulations and with their internal controls. And you reviewed in those materials and in our pre presentation, uh, the itemized incidents of non-compliance that occurred over the five-year term of the initial license. Um, and the IEB also noted, and you previously reviewed, that for each incident of non-compliance, the licensee responded promptly with appropriate remedial actions. And at that meeting in July, you did, in fact, vote and determined PPC to be suitable under the uh, statutory and regulatory criteria uh, that focus on integrity, character, financial stability, and compliance. Uh, so with that said, we did not plan to repeat the full compliance history today as you just reviewed it in July. Uh, and Andrew, for his part, intends to focus on current compliance at PPC, uh, knowing that you in the, in the public uh, already have that, the full history. Uh, so with that said, and with that backdrop, on, unless there are questions now, I would ask Andrew to, uh, to jump in and address the commission on agenda item 2BI. Thank you, Loretta. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, mm -hmm. As Loretta mentioned, this memo does focus on PPC's current compliance with an emphasis on the following six gaming areas the approved system of internal controls, the floor plan, the surveillance plan, the slot machine operation plan, credit procedures and suspension of credit, and the gaming beverage licenses. Uh, prior to the temporary closure, gaming agents at PPC would routinely conduct investigations and audits outside of the office on the casino floor, offering a more hands-on approach. Uh, however, due to the current guidelines, agents have been quick to adjust to the new norms of working primarily in our MGC uh, on-site surveillance office. Many of our investigations are now completed in review or through the lens of a camera. Uh, although this may have presented some early challenges, agents have easily adapted and have continued their routine monitoring with a focus on the six areas, as well as several other aspects of the property. Uh, additionally, agents have kept a continuous 24 presence on-site, as well as a now added presence of gaming agents working remotely throughout the day. This has allowed for several further investigations into those specific departments. Uh, speaking on each area separately with regards to compliance with the approved system of internal controls, the IEB has continued its review of PPCs, ICs, and submissions daily. As I mentioned, this is done through our new guidelines of routine monitoring through the surveillance system and through our operational audits. Uh, agents while working remote have continued auditing the internal controls and subsequently conducting investigations while on site. Uh, through this, the IEB certifies that PPC is currently in compliance with their internal controls. Uh, with regards to the floor plan and the surveillance plan, the IEB reviews both of these daily through routine investigations as well as continued operational audits. The IEB certifies that both the floor plan and the surveillance plan at PPC are currently in compliance. Uh, with regards to the slot machine operation plan, the IEB completes daily and monthly audits of the slot units on the casino floor as well as units in the approved storage locations. The IV finds that PPC is currently in compliance with their slot machine operation plan. With regards to credit procedures and the suspension of credit, PPC has remained compliant throughout. Uh, the IEB has documented zero issues relating to credit and finds that PPC is currently in compliance. And lastly, with regards to compliance with the gaming beverage licenses, the IB has reviewed the terms of PPC's license and its obligations with respect to the service and storage of alcoholic beverages. The IB continues to monitor those areas on a daily basis and finds PPC is currently in compliance with all beverage license requirements. Um, so just in closing here, the IEB does find that PPC has remained compliant and is still currently in compliance with the six gaming requirements of this category two license. Um, I can now open up to any questions there may be or throw back to uh, Loretta. Or Joe. Commissioners, any questions for Andrew? I have one, a Andrew, and, and, and perhaps it should be put into a parking lot for the end, but when uh, you and the, your um, team are certifying as to the floor plan and you're surveilling, are you certifying um, with respect to also COVID compliance too, with respect to COVID guidelines? Uh, we, do, we, we do check for COVID guidelines as well. Um, and that does fall under uh, the surveillance and floor plan. So those are checked daily. 
um, agents have easily adapted to checking these for these new COVID guidelines. Thank you. Any further questions for Andrew? Sure, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Andrew, I, I know that early on there were some issues at PPC with respect to locking appropriate alcohol beverage storage areas. Um, I'm assuming there hasn't been any complications with that uh, since some of those early incidents. If you could share any information you might have. Correct. Yeah, the IAB, we have um, documented zero issues relating to locking of the beverage or storage locations. Um, PPC is remaining compliant, um, at least since reopening um, and probably even prior as well. Andrew, thank you. Of course, you're very welcome. Okay, if there are no further questions for Andrew, I think next up we have Captain Connors. I think he was having a little, oh, there he is on the, on the Loretta's uh, screen. Good morning. We wait to start off the morning. Good I'm morning, proud to Captain. be Loretta Lilios for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> She's comfortable with that, I'm sure. She is. Uh, uh, so one of the, the one area that I've, I've been tasked with to address has to do with the compliance with the emergency and the critical incident response plan from PPC. Uh, as you know, with the gaming enforcement unit uh, being attached to each of the three casinos, uh, particularly at, at the Plain, Plain Ridge Park Casino, we're able to have a very close working relationship with them um, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, specifically with their security and their surveillance department. So um, they have submitted a a emergency and critical incident plan uh, that's very detailed, very extensive. It runs the gamut from how to operate a fire extinguisher to a major critical incident that may involve uh, an evacuate, evacuation of the building uh, and addressing any other types of uh, high risk scenarios. Um, and obviously, with the GEU being on site 24 7, uh, we're able to again, work closely with them, but also evaluate what their responses are on a consistent basis. And although fortunately we haven't had to deal with many of the critical incidents that were detailed within their, in their plan, uh, it is extensive. It does uh, cover many areas in great detail to give their staff the direction that they need um, on a consistent basis. Uh, and so we've been able to see at least some of that put into practice in the five years of their licensee, licensure um, and get an understanding as to how they operate. And in a general sense, I think it has gone very smoothly uh, with how things uh, are implemented there. Again, we haven't had those real significant incidents, but also sometimes it's within the details of the smaller incidents and how they handle those that you can really get a sense as to whether they're uh, complying with their written plans as well as um, just their day-to-day -day operations. And th those would include even just incidents of, you know, just general crowd control, uh, specific crowd control uh, measures during a specific event. Uh, they do have a consistent amount of medical uh, calls, in some cases emergencies that uh, in large part have all been handled very well. Uh, so. In that regard, I think we can take some comfort in that and that they've shown that consistently and they are adhering to their written policies, uh, which are which are extensive. Um, the one area additionally within working closely with them, we do work closely with their security and surveillance departments and their security directors. Uh, we do have an open line of, of that communication and can immediately address any issues that we see at any point. Um, there are a number of incidents, if you will, that I believe that they've handled very well, uh, including a number of power outages uh, for a very brief period of time. I think we've had four since the opening, and those were handled uh, very well by the, the people staff. Um, there was also one shutdown as it related to a major snowstorm back in 2017, and then obviously the, the COVID-related uh, shutdown in March of this year, and all these have gone uh, extremely smoothly and I think it's a testament to their staff and their preparedness in these issues and also working closely with us with uh, the Plainville Police Department uh, with local uh, fire and EMS as well so uh, in that regard I think they've they've uh, been consistent and one other area that I think is worth noting and, and highlighting is also the fact that having law enforcement on site 
is critical for any type of major incident response. The, the response time is absolutely critical. Um, the old adage that seconds count is rings true 100%. And the fact that uh, we are on site, we do have direct communications with PPC and their staff, and it has shown during the five year period that that communication is timely and consistent, I think is, uh, is, is a positive for uh, PPC and the staff and, and also for the, the commission can take some comfort in that as well. Um, as just a side note, we do, the GEU does uh, monitor and carry the security radio, so we are uh, in immediate contact should there be a significant incident uh, on site. And again, that, that response time is absolutely crucial. Uh, the communications thereafter with responding assets, coordinating those assets is something that it's not only detailed within their plan, but, but it's um, it's something that I, I'm comfortable that will take place should uh, a significant incident take place uh, in coordinating a, a response. So uh, as far as just addressing the, the areas, the categories, as far as additional measures identified, uh, at this time, the GEU has not identified any areas uh, requiring additional measures. Uh, we would not be recommending any particular uh, additional licensing conditions uh, in this particular area at all. And again, uh, overall, I think the, the relationship is strong and the process is strong and the responses have been strong. And uh, hopefully within another five years, uh, I'm reporting the exact same uh, thing uh, as far as status, as far as the ability to handle these issues. And we haven't had any significant issues as well. So uh, with that, I'm glad to take any questions or comments. Uh, Captain Connors, I, I do have a um, question. Um, uh, thank you for that report. First of all, it's very positive to hear about um, how well, whether it be critical incidents or the communication seems to be. Um, as you know, we worked very hard at the beginning to um, to make sure uh, GEU was um, made up of both Plain Ridge uh, uh, PD members as well as state police members, and I. I give credit to all of you who worked so hard initially on that MOU. The other thing we've talked about, and you mentioned it here today, is um, the relationships with uh, security, surveillance, the gaming agents, um, you know, all of the GEU, all of the um, uh, public safety folks. And um, I, I just wonder if you feel interoperability, you mentioned as well, big piece that uh, is lacking in some other jurisdictions. Um, if you feel like this really positive report with um, response time being exactly what they are, meaning uh, incidents are handled professionally, they're handled in a really timely manner, um, those strong relationships that were built over the years and continue to, uh, you know, continue to maintain have something to do with the fact that this report is so positive today. The fact that you just mentioned all of these folks uh, working hand in hand to keep it safe, in particular with a critical incident. No, that, that's absolutely correct, Commissioner. Uh, the, the relationship has been strong, and I think that that is just um, you know on a day-to-day -day basis from uh, the local police, the Plainville Police, and uh, and their fire and EMS. They're they're vested in the in the facility themselves. Uh, they're they're constantly the you know, Plainville PD is on site, uh, as you know, on the racing side. Uh, so. It really has to be a coordinated effort uh, in the event that there is any type of significant incident. But even in the relatively uh, minor incidents that we've had, um, it, it's, they've been handled very smoothly. It seems like the, the cooperation, the communication, that interoperability is is very strong. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm confident that it's going to continue. Thank you. I, I thank all of you for your efforts. Um, I don't know that everybody realized this. This is not always the case. Where where um, all of these folks work so seamlessly together, respect each other's talents and abilities, and share information in a timely manner. It's uh, it's it's really nice to see, and um, just proud of all the work you've done. And thanks for that uh, positive report. Thank you. Other questions for Captain Connors? Uh, yeah, just to add my comments of. Um, Thanks for the report. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's great to hear. I'm taken back to um, 
the comments we heard in the public hearing portion that was described earlier, how positive um, the community has received um, you know, the presence of PPC, especially in the light of what many people earlier, before the license was awarded, were fearful of in terms of what's, what's the usual criticism of, of, uh, of these type of operations of increased incidents and, and uh, uh, traffic and, uh, uh, you know, and in some ways, uh, they, all, they, they, all, they often get into the notion of uh, fearing some criminality. Um, and, and I uh, have to congratulate, uh, I think uh, to, a, to a great degree, this is the result of both the operation that you uh, speak of, but especially the presence, um, Captain Connors, of uh, what you uh, and your team and, uh, and the Plainville uh, police uh, have done in terms of making sure that there's deterrence prevention as well as rapid response. So thank you for the report and thank you for the work you do. Thank you, sir. Any further questions for Captain Connors? I think we can all um, echo that, uh, that gratitude. Thank you, Captain Connors, and thanks for the comprehensive report. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Okay, so if uh, no other questions for Captain Connors, we'll move on to the Finance and Accounting Division. We have Derek Lennon, our Chief Finance and Accounting Officer with us. Derek? Thank you, Joe. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning, Derek. I'm joined today by Doug O'Donnell, and uh, he's our Revenue Manager, and Dana Fortney, the CFO from uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino. And I just want to say that um, the information you have in your packet has been reviewed both internally as well as externally uh, to make sure that we're providing the correct information to you. Um, so today we're here to report on certain compliance areas with requirements of the Category 2 um, license and specifically the compliance with daily tax reporting, um, gaming revenue and taxes, compliance with an annual audit, the payment of the renewal fee, and the licensee's compliance with a capital expenditure plan. Um, so for the first area, compliance with daily tax reporting, um, Mass Federal Law Chapter 23K, Section 55, establishes the Commission's authority to collect taxes on gross gaming revenue on a daily basis. Section 55 um, requires category two licensees to pay a daily tax of 40% on its gross gaming revenue and an additional daily assessment of 9% of its gross gaming revenue to be deposited in the race plus development fund. The two areas um, the finance office measures for compliance with this um, section are, did the licensee remit the daily taxes? And then did the licensee remit taxes in a timely manner? Um, we've set goals for both of these measures. For the daily remittance, our goal is 100%. You have to pay the taxes. Um, and we're pleased to report that they have paid their taxes on a daily basis, so they're 100% compliant with that. Um, for timely rem remittance, we have set a goal of 90% compliance. And the chart in the memo um, shows that they have exceeded that goal every year. Um, so for this first category, we find the um, licensee to be compliant with the terms of the um, category two license and have no recommendations. Moving on to gaming revenue and taxes, um, as referenced in the first part of the memorandum, a category licensee, category two licensee is required to pay taxes of 40% on gross gaming revenue, an additional 9% assessment uh, to the race horse development fund. Um, PPC is in compliance with this requirement. The chart on the memo shows the facility generated $759 million in gross gaming revenue over its initial license period. That's a five, that's a five year period, not including July and August of this year, which shows up on our, on our website. Um, and that resulted in $303.6 million in taxes, which goes to local aid, and an additional $68.3 million to the Racehorse Development Fund for a total contribution of 371.97 million or approximately 372 million to state resources. Moving on to the next section, compliance with an annual audit. Um, to 
205 CMR 139.07 requires gaming licensees to have an audit prepared by an independent certified public accountant of its financial statements relevant to the operation of its Massachusetts gaming establishment. The regu regulation also requires the licensee to file the report with the commission on an annual basis. We're pleased to report the licensee has been compliant with that requirement and we have no recommendations. Payment of a renewal fee. Mass General Law Chapter 23K, Section 20F, sets the term of a Category 2 license to five years and requires the Commission to set a renewal fee. The renewal fee for PC was set at 100000 and the fee was paid to the Commission's Eastern Bank account via wire transfer on June 16, 2020, prior to the um, expiration of the license. We find the um, license fee to be compliant with this section. Compliance with the Capital Expenditure Plan. Mass General Law Chapter 23K, Section 21, Paragraph A, Subparagraph 4, requires the Commission to include in PPC's license conditions a requirement for the licensee to either make capital expenditures to a, its establishment equal to or greater than 3.5% of net gaming revenues or establish a multi-year capital expenditure plan equal to 3.5% of net gaming revenues derived at the establishment. This requirement was further detailed in 205 CMR 139.09. In January of 2017, PPC submitted a five-year plan to the commission requesting a variance from the 3.5% net capital expenditure requirement. In a public meeting in February of 2017, the commission found good, good cause was demonstrated for the five-year plan as submitted to not equal or exceed the 3.5% of net gaming revenue threshold and the Commission approved the plan with the five conditions outlined in the memorandum. For compliance with their approved plan, PPC has been including capital expenditures in their quarterly spend figures as well as in their annual report. For the Commission to rely on the information reported, the Commission staff and the PPC internal auditor have added audits of capital expenses to the PPP, PPC internal audit plan for fiscal years 2017, 19, and 2020. We have received the plans for 17 and 19 and have reviewed the information as well as our independent auditors have reviewed it and found it um, that the commission can rely on those um, and the information reported to them based on those audits. And once the 2020 plan is completed, we will see that we will review that audit as well and have our um, external auditors review it. 205 CMR 139.09 requires that a multi-year capital plan must at a minimum provide for the establishment of and contribution to a capital reserve account. 205 CMR 139.06 paragraph 1 requires the licensee to report quarterly on its contributions to the capital reserve account. PPC has established a construction and progress account and is which is consistent with their approved plan um, and we do recommend that they should include the contributions to this account in their quarterly report to the Commission as required by 205 CMR 139.06 paragraph 1 rather than rolling up those expenditures into the um, quarterly spend figures. Based on this information, um, we find them to be compliant with the exception of that one area and just recommend that they continue that they put that into their quarterly report. And that concludes our presentation. Questions for Derek? Commissioner? Uh, I, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I do have a question. Thank you for the report. Um, let me preface my question by saying that, you know, asking this question, I, I don't want to, um, create the impression by asking this question that this is an issue because I don't believe it is. But if you can go to page two of the report, uh, Derek, and perhaps a little bit for the record and in layman's terms, explain uh, uh, more the, the difference between the daily remittance compliance rate of 100% and the timely remittance, which, which goal is uh, to be above 90%, and it is in fact 9%. Um, what, uh, more than 90%. Um, what are some instances as to why uh, uh, there are times when the timely remittance is not 100%? What are we talking about in general? So the timely remittance requirement is um, 24 hours after the gaming day closes. We would have 
to get a gaming a um, tax payment. And there are multiple multiple reasons. Some of them are our bank account was down. Other areas are their banking um, software may not have been trans be able to transfer it. There may have been a pro a problem in the um, account room to complete their their process. Um, staff could be out that normally process the transaction. That's why we set it at 90%. The one we really care about is that we get the taxes. Um, and that is 100%. So, um, you know, the timely requirement, there are always going to be issues to that. And that's the reason we've set it at a 90% um, internal goal, because it's not always PPC's fault, it could be our fault, too. Um, so we look at that as a shared, um, a, a shared target. Thank you. That's that's good for the record. Any other questions for Derek and team, including Dana? Good morning, Dana. Good morning. Doug. All right. Okay. Uh, none appearing, I guess. Um, so why don't we move on to legal division? We have with us General Counsel Todd Grossman. Todd. Thank you, Joe, and good morning, commissioners and all. Um, I will be addressing two discrete areas of compliance. The first pertains to the gaming licensee's compliance with its legal obligations relative to the state lottery. And the second pertains to its compliance with its obligations relative to past due child support and tax liabilities that are owed to the Commonwealth. Um, and if I may, I'll begin with the state lottery compliance related uh, item and begin by noting that right in the findings and declarations uh, section of chapter 23k located in section one it says explicitly that enhancing and supporting the performance of the state lottery and continuing the commonwealth's dedication to local aid is imperative to the policy objectives of chapter 23k so in an effort to ensure that outcome section 15 of chapter 23k required that the licensee agree as a condition to even being eligible uh, to being awarded the gaming license initially, that uh, it agreed to three things essentially. The first, that it become a licensed state lottery sales agent to sell or operate the lottery, multi-jurisdictional and kino games. Second, that it make the lottery and kino games readily accessible to the guests of the gaming establishment. And third, that it not create, promote, operate, or sell games that are similar to or in direct competition with games offered by the state lottery, a commission including lottery instant games or its lotto style games such as Kino or its multi-jurisdictional games. The licensee, as you'll recall, as part of its RFA2 uh, application, agreed to each of those terms. And in furtherance of that pledge, it ultimately executed a lottery sales agent agreement with the Massachusetts State Lottery on June 16, 2015. That particular agreement remains in effect today. The agreement itself is a comprehensive document that outlines the obligations of each of the parties. And in conjunction uh, with the written commitment, I would submit to you that uh, PPC satisfies its legal obligations and requirements under Chapter 23K by virtue of having that agreement uh, in place. As you know, PPC has asserted in its written attestation as part of its renewal application uh, that it is in material compliance with that lottery agreement. I was able to confirm that statement with senior leadership at the State Lottery Commission and the lottery officials further confirm that PPC has been cooperative and participatory with the lottery regarding promoting lottery products. Uh, for these reasons, uh, there is sufficient factual basis for the commission to deem the gaming licensee to be in material compliance with its state lottery related obligations uh, for purposes of, of this uh, gaming license. So I can uh, pause there on the uh, lottery related obligations uh, for any questions or comments before we move into the, the DOR related matters. Questions for Todd. Also, yeah, um, oh, Councilor, sorry. thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Councilor, is there uh, any indication or conversation between the two parties about uh, conditions for reopening a lottery agreement and what that would, what that would include if um, they were to do so 
you know, uh, it's, I, I'm not sure if the agreement discusses reopening. I can just uh, relay that there was no indication that there needed to be any amendments to the terms of the agreement. Um, at the present time, uh, the lottery seems to be content with the terms that are in place um, and PPC's performance at the moment. Okay. Thank you. I th I, Madam Chair, I think it's also important to, uh, to uh, remind ourselves, you know, the great work that our research and responsible gaming group did with uh, the Sigma team to look at the lottery impact um, around the immediate area. And if I recall that those research results there showed that even with the addition of presence of Plain Ridge Park, as well as their, um, uh, their establishment as a, as a lottery agent, that there wasn't much there. I don't believe that Commissioner Zuniga will correct me. Uh, there was no significant impact on lottery sales from the other lottery agents in the immediate area. If I remember, yeah. wasn't it a positive impact? In, in, in the aggregate, it was a positive impact. There was some decrease that um, some uh, agents in the surrounding communities experienced and the period that they observed, but that was more than made up by the increase that um, PPC as a lottery agent brought in. And that, I think, speaks directly to what, uh, uh, what the legislature envisioned in the requirement that Todd just um, just described as agreeing to be an agent of the lottery as uh, an important uh, measure for its protection. And Commissioner Stebbins, to your point, um, and, and, and Todd, perhaps you can confirm, I do not believe there's any sunset provision on that agent agency agreement. It, it does follow the typical agency agreement of the lottery. Uh, so there is no, um, you know, a required renewal provision. Is that correct, Todd? That's right. I actually did ask that question. There is no expiration date on the agreement. It, yeah. it remains in effect until it's uh, revoked or otherwise modified. And, and that mirrors what, uh, what there's 7,600 agents in the Commonwealth for the lottery. It mirrors that um, arrangement. So, okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, um, if I may, then I'll move into the next area, um, and that relates to, again, the licensee's compliance with its legal obligations relative to the intercept of past due child support and tax liability to the Commonwealth. You'll recall, of course, that that obligation stems from uh, Chapter 23K, Section 51, which essentially provides, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, that prior to disbursement of cash or a prize in excess of $600, a gaming licensee shall review information made available by the Department of Revenue to ascertain whether the winner of the cash or prize owes past to child support to the Commonwealth or to an individual whom the DOR is providing services and to ascertain whether the winner of the cash or prize owes any past to uh, tax liability to the Commonwealth. You'll recall, of course, that the $600 figure referenced in that section of the law was uh, adjusted subsequently by way of legislation to $1,200. In an effort to detail the process by which the licensee would be granted access to the Department of Revenue information to determine whether intercepts are required um, and to satisfy its statutory obligations, an MOU between the Commission, the Department of Revenue, and the gaming licensee was executed. The MOU addresses such things as the instances in which a check has to be conducted, uh, which employees can actually conduct the check, and uh, information security procedures and other contractual type provisions. I've discussed uh, PPC's compliance uh, with this MOU with colleagues uh, over at the Department of Revenue. And with the exception of three instances of uh, non-compliance, which are detailed in the memo and uh, packet, the licensee has otherwise performed as it has been required to do. Um, I will submit, and I'm happy to run through each of those instances if that would be uh, helpful here today, but 
Um, otherwise, even in light of those, I would submit that there is evidence to support a conclusion that the licensee has been in material compliance with its legal obligations relative to the past due child support and tax liability. Um, and as I mentioned, there are those those three instances, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I'm not sure if that would be helpful to run through each of those at the moment, uh, but they are contained in the public act. Commissioners, would you like him to do so? Or are you all set? I guess that was it. that's hiring. All set? All set? Okay. Yeah, we have the materials and have been able to review them in advance. So thank you, Todd. Great. Thank you. Well, in that event, um, I don't have anything further. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to address any questions for Todd on the child support. I think we're all set. Thank you, Todd. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Todd. Um, so next up, we have a report from the racing division, Dr. Alex Lightbound, our director of racing. Alex. Thank you, Joe, and uh, good morning, commissioners. Today, um, I want to report that Plain Ridge is in accordance with uh, Mass General Law 23K, Section 24A. Um, they have maintained um, an existing racing facility on the premises, and they did hold their increasing number of racing days, um, 105 in 2015, up to 115 in 16, and then 125 in 2017. Um, and then after that, the um, uh, lets it be up to uh, working with the Gaming Commission in consultation with Plain Ridge and the Harness Horsemen's Association of New England. Um, and they did come um, to different numbers of days in those different years. Um, recently, they did sign a seven-year agreement that calls for 110 days of racing each year. Um, so uh, in further details with the having the purse agreement with the horsemen, uh, their first one was in 2014 a five-year one, and then um, uh, when that expired, they did come to an agreement on a seven-year first agreement that began in um, 2019. So they are um, in compliance with having a purse agreement. The uh, uh, Plain Ridge Park is also in compliance with Chapter 128A and Chapter 128C, which are the racing regulations, and um, they have applied for a racing license each of the last six years and been granted um, by the racing, uh, by the Gaming Commission, a racing and simulcast license. Um, there haven't been any um, issues related to non-compliance of the racing regulations, and uh, PPC is responsive and they work collaboratively with us, and um, we're basically in constant communication. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, Dr. Lightbaum, I just wanted to comment on, you just explained, you know, the last five years and the history. I just actually want to thank you, your team, and um, the uh, folks at PPC who work collaboratively, as you just explained, as well as the horsemen and women who, you know, worked hard to get these five-year and then seven-year purse agreements and, um, you know, work hard together in particular. Um, now during COVID to, to keep it safe. But, um, you know, we are uh, a model agency for the way that we uh, regulate racing. Um, and um, I, I just think listening to you and listening to how well everyone uh, collaborates, I know it wasn't always the case. So um, just a thank you and thank you for that positive report and all the work that you do to, um, uh, to keep racing uh, profitable, but also done with integrity uh, and following best practices. Thank you. Further questions for Dr. Lightbaum? I think we can attest to the, the close collaboration, most recently, of course, in the successful Derby Day where uh, novel COVID um, measures had to be taken. And it's really a testament to your leadership, uh, Dr. Lightbound, and, and the relationship you've established with PPC. So thank you. No, thank you. Okay. All set, I think. Okay, so uh, next up, a uh, report from our Information Technology Division. We have Katrina Jagrup Gomes, our Chief Information Officer, and Scott Helwig, our Gaming Technical Compliance Manager. Katrina? Good morning, Chair, Commissioner's Executive Director Wells. 
Uh, before we begin, I'd like to introduce the team that is presenting today. Um, like Joe said, beginning with Scott Helwig, our Gaming Technical Compliance Manager, Jason Giddle, Regional Director of Information Technology for PPC, and in the wings we have Kevin Gavro, our Senior Converged Engineer, and Priya Gendotra, our Gaming Technical Compliance Engineer. And by no means does this represent the number of individuals that worked on this, and as a special note, I'd like to recognize the collaboration due diligence and efforts put forth by both PPC and the MGC technology team. Today we will be presenting an update on PPC's compliance in the following areas. Certification and verification of electronic gaming device software, or EGDs. Certification of property online monitoring and validation systems. Information security plan and any license conditions to consider. I will now hand it over to Scott Helwig. Katrina, uh, hello, Chair and fellow Commissioners. Good morning, Scott. Good to see you. Good day. Good morning to you. Um, as Katrina said, I, I, my team and, and I, the Gaming and Technical Compliance team, worked with and collaborated with the uh, team from Plain Ridge Park Casino, uh, their technical team, I should say, and, and verifying and, and certifying the electronic gaming devices and the systems that, that help to manage these devices at, at the Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, so from October 25th, October 20th, 2015 until March 15th, 2020, prior to the suspension operation of operations due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Massachusetts Gaming Commission Central Monitoring System performed daily software validations on all active electronic gaming devices at Plain Ridge Park Casino. As a result, the MGC Central Monitoring System found no signature failures and all active software installed was approved by one of Massachusetts Gaming Commission's certified independent testing. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic closures, the NOC or Network Operations Center and the Gaming Technical Compliance Team continuously verified the electronic gaming devices software to ensure compliance. Uh, once PPC was given the approval to reopen, they continued to comply with MGC regulations regarding the EGD software operating at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Uh, the GTC, or game, sorry, the Gaming Technical Compliance Team found no electronic gaming device signature failures on active software since PPC's opening in June of 2015, or in June of 2015, and during, and also during the COVID-19 pandemic closures and reopening. Our verification excludes change requests to ensure accuracy. Uh, once a change request is approved, the MGC central monitoring system will force a software validation to ensure compliance. Uh, and if we do experience any issues with change requests or uh, on the gaming floor as well, we will work with the IEB gaming agents, the slot tech team at the casino, and also our network operations team to ensure that we work out any issues and they get resolved in a timely manner. Uh, and, and as of today, we have not had any issues where nothing has gotten resolved or, or there's been a, a kind of a, a, a back and forth of, 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 you know, why the problem happened. Um, and that, that wraps up the, the items for the electronic gaming devices. And I will um, go over the, uh, the notes for the management systems of the electronic gaming devices at uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino. Uh, so Plain Ridge Park, Park Casino's management system is certified by one of our certified independent testing labs and verified by the gaming technical compliance team. Uh, the, GT, the gaming technical compliance team verified the software signatures uh, and all are in compliance with MGC regulations. Uh, the process included confirming the currently libraries uh, on, their, on their systems and their compliance with the certification letters provided by our certified independent testing labs. Uh, the, G the gaming technical compliance team found no signature failures on active libraries uh, since PPC's opening in June 2015 mm -hmm. and during the COVID-19 pandemic closures and reopening. Um, in closure, uh, I'd also like to note and, and thank the uh, technical team at, at Plain Ridge Park Casino for for helping us getting through verifying um, all the signatures over the course of the last few months. Uh, so I'd like to say in accordance with 205 CMR 143 and 144, uh, it is determined that Plain Ridge Park Casino or PPC is in compliance with the applicable regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. For... No, go ahead, Kathy. You're about to say the same thing. Do you want to do it per uh, presentation or wait to the conclusion? 
Um, I was going to offer the opportunity to ask questions now before we go into the information security plan. Commissioners, any questions for Scott? Nice straightforward presentation, Scott. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So uh, moving on to the information security plan, pursuant to 205 CMR 138.02 and follow, further detailed in 143.12, the submitted information security plan was reviewed, which included 23 policies and standard operating procedures. The MGCITS team found 100, 115 issues and recommendations. All feedback was provided to PPC which was reviewed by the necessary teams and the documents were updated as applicable. In some cases, they even rewrote their policies to ensure improved compliance, for example, their hardware sanitization policy. In accordance with 205 CMR 138.02 and further detailed in 143.112, it is determined that Plain Ridge Park Casino is in compliance with the applicable regulations. As for license conditions to consider, the Information Technology Services Division does not recommend any additional licensing conditions at this time. And this concludes our presentation. Any questions for Katrina and team? All good news. Commissioner. Okay, very, yes, thank you. Um, just, I was just gonna comment on that. Um, not surprising given what I understand from the beginning, uh, the power of the technology and the power of the team that, have, that we have um, monitoring, understanding the technology, the central monitoring system had, you know, has, has the power to detect issues immediately, uh, reconcile to the penny uh, on 100% of the activity. And that's just a couple of the highlights. So um, I'm happy to hear the report uh, from Scott and Katrina, uh, but I know that it's, um, a testament to the technology, the team on, on the PPC side, and the team on our side to be able to both understand, test it, and verify it um, on a daily basis. Commissioners, any further questions? I also, I, I um, inherited um, a lot of the success but there's also, of course, the Play My Way feature uh, that we know took a, a great deal of collaboration. Again, uh, leader, leading uh, the way. So we credit that to PPC and of course to the IT department for its success. So, thank you. All right, so if there's no other questions, um, next up, we have Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development with uh, Joe Griffin, our Director of Workforce Supplier and Development, and Crystal Howard, our Program Manager. I'm not seeing Joe. No. Um, Let's just see, I'm, I'm looking at my document too. I'll try and reach out to her, Madam Chair. Hold on. Yeah, well, what are we? Uh, That's okay. We, we can just we can just pause for a second. I think okay. everybody can get their notes. I'm scrolling through, so we'll just give her a chance. I saw that she was on before, so there just might be. Hopefully, it's not a big branch like the one that Burke is encountering. I was just going to share, uh, Madam Chair, uh, unfortunately, due to the winds that went through and the storms this morning, uh, Jill was on the call earlier. I don't know if her area might have had a power outage. That's what we just were wondering, if she could have had a power outage. We were worried that there could be a few folks who couldn't make it. Let me just, I thought I saw her early on with her tile, but I might have been mistaken, or there could have just been a disruption. So let's just give uh, Karen two minutes, because I'm still scrolling through my document anyway. Um, and then if need be, uh, Joe will, um, will skip to the next presenter. Got a GLI here. Here we go. Uh, Madam Chair, so Jill did get booted off the system. She tried calling in, but 
uh, she was on mute. She's trying to get in again, and if she can't, she will call in, and, and I have her number so we can unmute her. So either way, we're going to get this resolved. Okay. Should we um, should we proceed with the next presentation or wait another minute? Or uh, so? She asked if you just give her a minute to see if she can jump on. Yeah. So everybody, in terms of the document, if you're scrolling through, uh, Jill's um, starts on page 109. There are 20 pages after that. And can you hear me? There we, we go. Can. Yes, there we she can. Is. <laughs> Welcome. So I don't know what happened, um, uh, well, Chair Judge Stein. I got kicked off. I was just ready to go, and uh, I don't know well, if I had a power outage here. So well, um, we we were discussing that in your absence. We knew that with the um, the winds, there could be disruptions. So we're glad to see you live, and thank you. And um, and again, I pointed out to everyone that it's 109 on our packet. So we're all set, Jill. Great. Right, thank you. Um, so um, from the opening of the casino on um, July 24th, 2015, the Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development Department has overseen um, several facets of the compliance of the licensee um, through the regular review and quarterly reports submitted um, to regular communication with department leaders, um, especially in human resources and procurement. Um, but Joe mentioned earlier that in 2018, staff began a review of Plain Ridge Park Casino's progress towards meeting their goals um, related to workforce development specifically. Um, we looked at their original application, um, their host and surrounding community agreements, their strategic plan to engage and recruit the diverse and underemployed workforce population, also known as their workforce plan. And we looked at associated RFA2 requirements. Um, we met several times with Plain Ridge Park management um, and department leaders, and Plain Ridge Park briefed the Commission Audit Committee on substantially complete matters. At the February 28, 2019 meeting, uh, commission meeting, Plain Ridge Park briefed the commission regarding its compliance with the above items. And if you'll remember, the commission approved a revised workforce plan. Um, the Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development Department reports to the commission today on its review of um, certain items um, regarding their Category 2 license and their RFA 2 commitments. In your memo, um, um, you'll notice A through F of their memo pertain to license conditions, including agreements and MOUs between impacted live entertainment venues, community colleges, as well as the required um, vendor diversity programs during design and construction, affirmative action programs for equal opportunity, a plan to identify and market to unemployed residents in Massachusetts, and a tourism and hospitality plan. Um, this review also focused on RFA2 compliance and items G through L of the memo focused on vendor spending in Massachusetts, um, vendor diversity, employment goals, and hiring commitments completing and adhering to a hiring plan and average wage scale commitments. Um, so I'm pleased to report that the compliance with the impacted live entertainment agreement um, has been met. Um, as you know, each gaming licensee is required to implement and abide by um, its agreement as per 23K section 1510. Um, and you'll also note this was um, Plain Ridge had one impacted live entertainment agreement with a mass performing um, arts coalition. And their president, Troy Siebels, testified confirmation in the hearing as well. Um, Plain, Plain Ridge also fulfilled um, this, the um, MOU collaboration between the community colleges. Um, the Mass Casino Careers Training Institute 
and um, Penn National Gaming MOU was signed on September 20th of 2013 and submitted with the RFA2. Lane Ridge works with both Massasoit and Bristol Community Colleges and the Mass Department of Labor and Workforce Development's Mass Higher Career Centers. MGC staff does recommend that at a later date, Plain Ridge Park Casino work with the Mass Community Colleges to update the 2013 agreement to better reflect the new goals and strategies in the revised workforce plan. Um, compliance with the affirmative marketing programs for business in Chapter 3, Chapter 23K, Section 21A21. Um, this con condition was met. Penn National Gaming's leadership and Turner Construction's consistent focus on the diversity goals throughout the construction period led to strong results. Um, construction Oversight Manager Pink and Company provided on-site compliance and ver verification. Penn National also worked closely with MGC's vendor advisory team and other state resources provided. Um, compliance with the Affirmative Action Program for Equal Opportunity to Residents identified in Chapter 23K, Section 21A22. Um, Penn National and Turner Construction exceeded most of their diversity goals for the union construction workforce. They fell short of their goal um, for hiring females in the trades. Women accounted for 4% of the total construction work hours versus a goal of, of 7%. Um, they exceeded the goals for um, minority individuals and, and veterans in the construction workforce. Um, compliance with the license condition plan to identify and market to unemployed Massachusetts residents. Plain Ridge Park Casino complied with this license condition. The Donahue, um, UMass Donahue Institute um, study found that more than 50% of the new hires at Plain Ridge Park Casino had previously been unemployed. Um, compliance with a license condition um, uh, 14, for the Regional Tourism, Marketing, and Hospitality Plan. Um, Penn National is required to submit a Regional Tourism, and Marketing, and Hospitality Plan created in consultation with the Regional Tourism Council and with the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino complied with this license condition. In 2015, they consulted with the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism um, and members from the regions of Boston, Metro West, Bristol County, and Plymouth County to complete the hospitality plan as required by Chapter 23K, Section 18. Um, Plain Ridge additionally has demonstrated strong local and regional tourism partnerships. Examples of the partnerships include um, a strong relationship with um, Simon Property Group of New England, the owner of Rentham Village Outlets, Premium Outlet Center. Um, and there were other examples as evidenced in the public hearing, um, the recent public hearing. to their loyalty database through cross-marketing efforts, including targeting out-of-state residents. As, as part of the Marquee Rewards Program, the licensee promoted stay and play complimentary trips, including to the Patriot Place and the licensee's properties. Um, as per um, Chapter 23K, Section 18, um, number two, the licensee utilized social media to promote local businesses, such as the Ever So Humble Pie Company, Bass Pro Shops, and Franklin Ford through promotional gifts to their customers. Um, the
Plain Ridge Park Casino website, plainridgeparkcasino.com, also, as required by Chapter 23K, um, features a variety of local area hotels. Um, however, some of the commitments in the Regional Tourism and Marketing Plan were not met. The Plain Ridge Park Casino attestation to the Commission indicated that they had executed and followed the tourism plan, except for the following areas. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino introduced tourism kiosks in the casino lobby, offering promotional information. Um, these were introduced in 2015 and they were removed after one year due to low usage. Um, the property developed a bus program in 2016 focused on the Asian markets of greater Metro Boston area. After testing the program for a full, full year, it was discontinued due to low volume. Plain Ridge Park Casino has not partnered with any campgrounds or RV parks to date. They plan to work with Normandy, Normandy Farms on partnership opportunities for the 2021 season. Um, in terms of educating casino staff on promoting regional tourism, um, although in place when the property first opened, it was not continued when Penn National streamlined the training program. They plan to revi revisit this in the future. Um, MGC staff additionally noted that links to the regional tourism websites to promote local attractions were not readily evident on the PlainRidgeParkCasino.com website. These links were, however, available in the past, but removed perhaps coinciding with the national company-wide website revamp. Um, and I just add that Plain Ridge Park Casino, at the request of the commission staff, are updating the hospitality and tourism plan for the commission review and approval at a future date. The commission will have a chance to discuss um, these issues um, and discuss their compliance um, in the future. Um, and now I'm going to move on from license conditions to compliance with RFA 2 statements. Um, first, uh, regarding vendor spending in Massachusetts and vendor diversity. Um, MGC staff affirms that these commitments have been met. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino has built relationships with suppliers in the state. They have conducted vendor fairs on site to allow vendors to introduce their projects, uh, the pro products and services um, to the property. Um, they have strong relationships with the United Regional Chamber um, as evidenced by um, testimony at the hearing from Jack Link and also with the Tritown Regional um, Chamber of Commerce, the Greater New England Minority Supplier Development Council and the Center for Women in business enterprise. Um, compliance with RFA 2 statement um, regarding vendor diversity. Licensees are required as per ch chapter 23K section 15 III to set specific goals for the utilization of minority women and veteran owned businesses for the pr provision of goods and services for the casino. This goal has been met. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino has complied with their plan. In their, 20, in their 2019 year end report, Plain Ridge Park Casino exceeded all vendor diversity goals for the procurement of goods and services, with 28% spent with minority women and veteran owned businesses. Um, and um, uh, and I'll just point out on page um, eight of my memo, there was an editing error that I would like to correct for the record. Um, but the uh, 
Um, the point is they exceeded their MBE goal, um, they exceeded their VBE goal, and their WBE goal as well. Um, operational hiring commitments and workforce plan, um, hiring numbers and diversity. As per Chapter 23K, Section 18, 17, as um, it demonstrated during the last five years of quarterly reports, in addition to providing opportunities for unemployed individuals, Plain Ridge Park Casino has demonstrated significant efforts to achieve and have in most cases exceeded their goals. Um, I mentioned that um, at the request of commission staff, um, Plain Ridge Park Casino amended their original workforce diversity plan that was submitted to the commission in August of 2014 prior to their uh, 2015 opening. Um, in June of 2019, the commission approved an amended plan that included additional hiring strategies and adjusted goals. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino implemented a new Massachusetts resident hiring goal. Um, they um, were approved to reduce uh, their local and surrounding community resident hiring goal to 35%. The previous 90% goal, um, which was set when they had a proposal in Springfield, was never met. Um, they increased their minority hiring goal um, as well. Um, the commission approved um, also including additional recruitment strategies in the plan, hosting an annual on-site career fair per calendar year, attending a veterans career fair, and attending at least two college career fairs in Massachusetts, partnering with the Mass Hire Career Centers and coordinating two hiring events. Um, as of March 31st, 2020, people Plain Ridge Park Casino has exceeded all their employment goals, apart from the goal to hire 35% of their employees from their host and designated surrounding communities. As of this report, they only fell slightly short with 32% local employees. Um, um, they exceeded their 15% worth workforce goal from ethnic minority groups um, in their last report of March 30, 31st, 2020. The actual was 26. Um, they hired 48% um, females, actually just falling slight, uh, slightly uh, lower than their 50% goal. Um, they exceeded um, their veterans goal of 2% um, hiring 5% veterans. And in spite of um, being so close to Rhode Island, they have consistently hired more than 60% of their employees who are residents of Massachusetts. Um, Jill, can I ask, Jill, can I just interrupt briefly on, yes. on I'm looking at page um, nine, and I think you said 50% for women, but their goal was 47, so they actually exceeded it by 1%, correct? Or am, am, I, am I on the right page? Um, I actually had the same question. Um, I believe the goal has always been 50%, and they've always been a tad short. Is this a typo? Yeah. That's what Actually, I wondered. Yes, um, and I think I see Kathy Lucas there. Their goal has, I believe, been 50%, so that's an editing error. Okay, I think I mentioned, you. yeah. Um, that's correct. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you and, Kathy. And historically, I remember that's just been a little bit of a challenge. Okay, excellent. Right. Yes. So I think that's been a challenge for all of our licensees for some reason, um, but they came um, fairly close this time. No, Sorry, our, I didn't our, goal, mean to, okay. our goal was 50% and we hit 52. We, we achieved the goal for females. 
Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Good. So that's an update to this report. I hate yes. hated to break up your momentum, but it was just it's an important metric. So we. I, I appreciate it actually. Thank you. Um, um, Plain Ridge Park Casino um, has um, complied with the requirement um, for the average wage scales. This can be. This condition um, has been met as determined by the commission vote on April 29, 2019. In order to review the number of employees and the salary and benefits projections, um, Plain Ridge Park Casino made in their 2013 RFA 2 application, um, staff compared their RFA 2 projections in the full compendium scenario to the 2018 compendium um, in the full com competition scenario to the 2018 compendium results submitted to MGC staff. Compared to the RFA2, the 2018 data showed that Plain Ridge Park Casino came within 96% of their total salary and benefits projected in their RFA2 application. Um, and um, lastly, um, their operational goods and services procurement plan. Um, Plain Ridge Park Casino has complied with their original operational goods and services procurement plan approved by the commission in um, 2014. The licensee submits quarterly reports regarding in-state and surrounding community, as well as diversity spend quarterly to, to the commission. Over the five years of the license, Plain Ridge Park Casino has met or exceeded most of their diversity goals um, after a period, after several periods after opening in, in 2015. Um, the licensee has submitted a draft update to their goods and services procurement plan um, to be discussed in a future commission meeting um, for a commission vote. And then um, to close out, I would just say that additional license conditions are not recommended at this time. Staff advises that the MOU between um, Penn National Gaming and the Massachusetts Casino Careers Training Institute dated September 2013 should be updated to reflect their goals and commitments in their new revised workforce plan. And both the updated tourism and hospitality plan and the operational goods and services plan um, will be discussed at a future date. And this is all reflected in the existing license conditions that Joe will discuss later. Um, questions? Um, Question. Jill, this is Commissioner O'Brien. I, I wanted to go back to um, page four of the memo you talk about how they just missed the mark with the women, uh, their goals for the women in construction. The goal was seven and they were at four. And I know the memo says that you, uh, FGC staff, consistently met with Turner Construction and, and PPC about trying to meet that goal and they said they didn't have enough women in trades. Can you just talk a little bit more about, was that because the women in trades program, the MGC, was part of, was in its germination stage or was there something else going on? You know, um, very good question. Um, so MGC staff um, worked closely with Turner and um, met regularly with the unions. Um, we determined that there really was a supply issue. Um, they did not have women who were on the bench and, and um, available to work on this project. Um, we were concerned given the size of the project compared to um, the two large resort casino construction projects that hadn't yet um, been developed. Um, so um, we pulled together members of um, um, construction companies, vendor advisory groups, and other um, experts. And after six to eight months, came up with a strategy that was introduced following this project. Um, that you've heard about um, 
um, that introduced the Build a Life That Works campaign, advertising that this is a career, um, construction is a career that is viable for women. Um, and I, I wish we had had that around um, early on, but um, I can say that um, Plain Ridge Park Casino and Turner Construction, I believe, tried their very best um, with all and were very committed um, to the diversity goals. Okay. So in your view, that experience really helped um, motivate everyone to move forward with the plan that resulted in the numbers on the other two projects? Well, yes, it motivated everyone, but it also um, gave us more information um, about the economy, the availability of the workforce. Um, and there was a little bit of a difference. Some of the unions actually um, were down in the Southwest um, part of Massachusetts and, and not so much. Um, it, their workforce was a little bit different and not located in the greater Boston area. So I think there also was a difference there. Oh. Okay. Thank you. If I, if, if I could follow up on that, um, Director Griffin, I actually think this is more of a, a, a tribute to your leadership and um, uh, the women involved with construction that have fought for so many years to add to their numbers. So I, I think um, the experience with PPC having difficulty finding, as, as you attest to, it's not that they didn't try, but there was uh, the, the um, the availability was not there at the time, um, really was started this, uh, you know, the impetus to start this whole program, which I think our other two uh, uh, license licensees demonstrated uh, a willingness to engage and those numbers were significantly better. Um, so that really is about a determined group of people being intentional about um, about changing that dynamic. So I give you credit for that and, and the women in construction and our licensees who certainly participated. I actually think your diligence in following these numbers closely, uh, it's always an added uh, when you know you're being, you know, really in one way judged on, on your numbers, helps you to work harder. I'm, I'm pleased with the report, very pleased actually from Ms. Lucas that um, because I've mentioned this every year, tell me where you're struggling a little bit in hiring women. And um, as, uh, you know, but, but to say that they've actually gone to 52% now, uh, I really credit uh, PPC with staying with that and making the improvements necessary to, um, to achieve that goal and, and all of the other goals. So um, good work by, I, I think, uh, Director Griffin and, and, and as well as the uh, licensee for working collaboratively and, um, and really achieving these very, very strong results. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I actually would like to acknowledge the folks over at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, you heard from Kathy Lucas, their VP of HR, um, Dale Fortney, VP of Finance, Michelle Collins, VP of Marketing, and Lisa McKenney, the Compliance Manager, worked very hard providing many, many documents during this project. So I'd like to just thank them. And, and of course, last but not least, um, Program Manager, um, Crystal Howard, who you all know. Um, of note to me of what you just said there is, first of all, our leadership team is headed up by a woman and all of the four uh, executives from Penn that you just mentioned are women. So, I mean, it just, it just makes the point. So again, thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Jill? Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that thorough report, Jill. Um, I, uh, let me just mention something about a couple of programs that you mentioned have been uh, discontinued. Um, the, you know, the, because of low usage, the bus program, the kiosk program. I, uh, I certainly agree with your ultimate conclusion as to the need to update or revise the tourism plan. I do not fault uh, PPC for uh, suspending the programs, as I'm sure you don't either. Uh, due to low usage, they, if, if, if they were 
uh, taken as an, a need for compliance purposes and just kept there, they could easily turn into the, the opposite effect of what they are trying to uh, achieve in, in people perhaps perceiving those as old or stale, etc. So um, thanks for mentioning them. And I think ultimately the conclusion is the most important one, which is this might be provide a good opportunity to think of new programs to um, to uh, look at uh, take a refresh at the plan, the tourism plan, and uh, and, and go from there. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Stebbins. Sure, Madam Chair. Thank you, and 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 thanks to Jill and Crystal for their great work over the last five years and in the in this good update and report. Um, and just. Um, just a reminder or a point of information about the, uh, the construction work. Uh, the point person for diversity from Turner Construction was a, uh, a woman who was um, is is ardently pursuing uh, their goals, as as Jill pointed out. So um, it certainly wasn't lost on us. Um, but Turner Construction, to their credit. Uh, made a very aggressive effort to try to meet some of those female numbers on construction. And obviously it has is, is led us to success on the other two projects. Um, interestingly enough, I think, uh, you know, pointing out that a good number of uh, PPC employees come from Rhode Island, and I would chalk that up, and I appreciate Jill's comments, I would chalk that up, one, to proximity, uh, two, to the, the level of pay, I believe there's a, a minimum wage differential between Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, and I would also credit it to um, uh, the fact that PPC has proven themselves as a good solid employer with many opportunities for uh, promotions and professional development along the way. But um, Jill, if you have any other thoughts on that, I'd welcome to hear those. Um, well, I, I actually think that um, Plain Ridge Park Casino's um, strong relationships with the career centers, the Mass Higher Career Centers, and the community colleges um, play into that as well. Um, and they have made a commitment to recruiting from Massachusetts. Um, so I think their efforts um, and their commitment um, show in the results. To follow up on that, Jill, uh, at the, the public hearing, I, I, I referenced this, this challenge. Um, I'm looking again at the stats that you just went through, and, and to your point, um, PPC did exceed its, its goal of, of retaining 60% of its workforce from Massachusetts by 3%. Uh, it, the only place that was a little bit short was of course on, on the, high, the goal of hiring from the immediate uh, surrounding communities. And I think if these are, are correct, it was 35% goal with a 32% um, actual. So I, I had referenced um, this at the public hearing because it's perspective work. In light of the pandemic, um, I am wondering how we're going to use your great skills in holding our licensees accountable that you know as as commissioner cameron referenced um to and also provide support to um to ensure the, the local hires and the massachusetts hires and actually maybe leverage what will be a new unemployment rate when when the last five years massachusetts unemployment rate was so low now, of course, with the pandemic, it, it's a very different um, <clears throat> landscape for our unemployment. So I just am hoping that prospectively, we'll be able to provide the support for the, the job fairs um, as they ramp up their, their um, employee base to, to take advantage of and, and perhaps even exceed these, these goals, given uh, our unemployment right now. Your point is well taken. Um, you know, the um, unemployment rate in their host and surrounding communities um, prior to the pandemic uh, was lower than the statewide average. That's right. um, so um, 
it was a, a challenge to hire locally. And, you know, that dynamic may have changed. And I think the relationships with the local partners will be especially critical to make sure that um, this dynamic continues and, and that they can perhaps even um, increase that percentage. Thank you. Any other questions for Jill? Excellent report. Always fascinating and always reflective of, of your leadership and, and, and as, I, as I say, the, um, the accountability that you expect of, of our licensees. So thank you. And uh, to Kathy and team, thank you. I love that Kathy had that stat right there. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. Excellent. Joe? Okay, so moving uh, right along, our next uh, topic of discussion is our research and responsible gaming. And we have with us Mark Vanderlinden, our Director of Research and Responsible Gaming. Mark? Thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairwoman and, and Commissioners. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, uh, responsible gaming and mitigating problem gambling at Plain Ridge Park Casino over the past five years. So embedded in the Expanded Gaming Act are numerous provisions um, to mitigate problem gambling and promote responsible gaming. Uh, consistent with this direction early in the commission's life, the MGC engaged a range of stakeholders, including um, several at Plain Ridge Park Casino, to create a responsible gaming framework. Since that time, this framework has informed the development of gaming regulation in Massachusetts and provided an overall orientation to each of our licensees on responsible gaming uh, policy and practice. Since Plain Ridge Park Casino opened, they've maintained a commitment to promoting responsible gaming and mitigating problem gambling consistent with the commission's values and the aims outlined in the responsible gaming framework. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the voluntary self-exclusion program, the voluntary credit suspension program, the Game Sense Information Center, Play My Way, and Plain Ridge Park Casino's Responsible Gaming Plan. So first, uh, voluntary self-exclusion. Uh, this I consider a cornerstone of the commission um, and our licensees overall efforts to uh, assist those struggling with a gambling problem or experiencing gambling related harm. The Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program provides patrons with one means of addressing problem gambling behavior by promoting, prohibiting their entrance, entrance to the gaming area of the gaming establishment or any area in which paramutual or simulcast wages are placed. PPCs, BSC policies and procedures meet the requirements outlined by, uh, by regulation and statute. Uh, the MGC IEB noted that, PPC, that in PPC's five years of operations, a total of 103 voluntary self included persons breached the VSC agreement and were allowed to enter the prohibited area on the casino property. It should be noted that uh, this, this number isn't necessarily an indication of PPC's failure to enforce it, but it actually is an indication of they are enforcing it in collaboration with our IEB. Um, individuals on the floor are identified um, and, and at that point they're um, asked to leave the gaming establishment. However, there were two noted instances in which PPC had been found non-compliant with MGC regulation. In both cases, PPC implemented a corrective action plan and no further action was necessary by the MGC. In terms of the voluntary credit suspension program, uh, this program allows patrons who do not wish to voluntarily self-exclude, but still wish an option to limit or restrict um, their access to financial credit within, within the casinos. PPC's um, voluntary credit suspension policies and procedures meet the requirements outlined in regulation. Um, it is not a popular program, especially at, at uh, at Plain Ridge Park Casino at this point. Um, there's very few persons that have enrolled in uh, the credit suspension program. I do not have that exact number. The IEB has documented zero issues in the five years regarding um, related to credit uh, access. The GameSense Information Center, also one of the, the key um, 
pillars within the responsible gaming strategies of both Plain Ridge Park Casino and the MGC. GameSense Information Centers are located on site at all Massachusetts casinos and operate 16 hours a day, seven days a week by trained GameSense advisors. At PPC, the GameSense Information Center is strategically located just off the gaming floor near the elevators to the parking garage. It's welcoming, it's, it's visitor friendly. Um, it also includes a, a private space for more sensitive conversations, including assisting individuals enroll in the voluntary self-exclusion program. The space provided by PPC is, it's a requirement that is outlined um, by statute um, that requires operators to provide on-site space for an independent substance abuse and mental health counseling service to be selected by the Gaming Commission. Um, in early on when we were identifying this space and working with, with PPC, they were gracious to, to identify and provide a space that, that provides such high traffic in a high traffic area that is as welcoming as it is. The GameSense Information Center has been operational since PPC opened, providing patrons and uh, PPC employees with information and resources on positive play, at risk, and problem gambling. The fourth area is Play My Way. Play My Way is a budgeting tool designed to allow players the ability to monitor the amount of money that they spend on electronic gaming machines or casino or uh, slot machines at Plain Ridge Park Casino. While Play My Way is neither a gaming regulation nor uh, outlined a statutory requirement, it's consistent with Plain Ridge Park Casinos and MGC's commitment to promoting safe levels of play. In 2014, Plain Ridge Park Casino agreed to test pilot Play My Way. And on June 9, 2015, Play My Way was launched on the gaming floor. Through 2000, December of 2019, nearly 25,000 players have actively enrolled in the program with an unenrollment rate um, of 14%. Plain Ridge Park Casino staff have been cooperative in all aspects of the development, implementation, maintenance, general operation, and evaluation of this program. The final area that I want to touch on is Plain Ridge Park Casino's Responsible Gaming uh, Plan. The Plain Ridge Park Casino Responsible Gaming Program outlines policies and procedures um, and programs consistent with the MGC's expectations that gaming be conducted in a manner to minimize harm. The plan that they've, uh, um, they've adopted includes initiatives to address each of the seven strategies outlined in the Responsible Gaming Framework. Highlighted in the plan are efforts to train casino employees, utilizing our GameSense, uh, our GameSense staff on site, incorporating and adopting the GameSense branding strategy and GameSense information centers, Supporting Play My Way, as well as protections for vulnerable and underage populations. Responsible alcohol service, <coughs> as well as responsible marketing policies. The Division of Research and Responsible Gaming support the relicensure of Plain Ridge Park Casino in the areas which we, we directly oversee, and we do not have any additional license recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Questions for Mark? I, I just have a, a question. It's more probably just a clarifier. Um, because the number 103 for the VSC breaches seems so high. How, do you know, Mark, um, and maybe we don't separate this out by property, but the number of VSCs I guess because it, it, it's all the, across the Commonwealth, of course, the VSCs apply to all the Commonwealth. In total right now, or maybe in the first, maybe on the average over the first five, their first five years, has, what has the total VSE been? You know, we currently have roughly a thousand individuals that have ever enrolled in the voluntary self-exclusion program, and that includes individuals who have completed the term that they've wanted to sign up for and, and um, as well as the exit session. You know, I was um, just before this presentation, I, I was kind of thinking about that exact same uh, question, Chair, um, and wondering how many individuals specifically 
um, enrolled at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, I don't have that number um, right off right off hand, um, but um, in terms of the, the the what seems like a relatively high number, again, I think that it, it speaks to the enforcement of yes. of, uh, of the regulation um, to diligently monitor the gaming floor and implement and oversee the policies that would identify persons if they do uh, breach that agreement to be identified um, and, and quite honestly supported in their their original decision to sign up to the program. Enrique, maybe you can help me with this because you yeah. were there. Yeah, I, uh, I was going to speak to that. Um, uh, perhaps the key word that Mark just mentioned is support. Um, mm -hmm. These individuals, individuals to, and, and there's a you know a, a very wide range of how people uh, try to manage uh, their, their their play if they're thinking um, it's getting a little bit out of hand. Um, is um, what, what what's important to, to try to understand is that uh, these systems are put in place to try to support how they're trying to get uh, to manage that play. And the self-exclusion program is, is, is the prime example. Uh, and it also, I would say, is centered on that self, the person who is trying to manage. So uh, the program removes incentives like the, the, the suspension of, 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 um, of jackpots and whatnot. Um, and there's uh, you know, processes in place at the casino to try to, um, to help, to help uh, support them. Notably, the Game Sense program, who, who gets to know and makes a lot of those voluntary self exclusions um, um, in the first place. So um, I think it's it's a it's a very relevant question, Chair, that you ask. What would be perhaps a level that uh, that that could give us some indication or benchmarking? Um, I'm remembering as you posed the question. Um, a good conference that I attended, a, a speaker, uh, you know, in, uh, was was making the point around uh, people who violated uh, violate those um, uh, self exclusion terms, or 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 then, or maybe go from one term, and then we you know play, and then we knew again, and then play, uh, etc. The point there was, if you look at the totality of what you're trying to do, which is reduce harm. Maybe that person who is signing up and maybe violating or going back to play and signing up for another term is in effect managing in their own way the total of their play coming at different intervals perhaps. So um, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a very relevant question and I would emphasize perhaps what we are all left with, regulators, operators, and people like, uh, uh, like GameSense advisors is to think about the ways in which we can support those efforts, those efforts of the self to try to manage their play. Mm -hmm. I don't so, know if that answers really No, that, question, that really helps. It really, um, what it shows is that the VSC um, and the efforts of the individual alone um, aren't probably sufficient to really give the, the assistance that they're, they're seeking. It does require the vigilance that Mark mentions and the support that you mentioned. So, but that first step is, is such an important step, but continued vigilance, continued support, and having those eyes right on the floor through the Game Sense Advisors is critical. Right. So, let, let me mention one thing, you know, that is relevant on this. Um, early on, uh, you know, when we were thinking about these programs, it's, it's great to hear Mark uh, take us back all the way to when we started the Responsible Gaming Framework. There was, a, 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 what I would say, it was a very conscious decision not to replicate a couple of uh, practices from other jurisdictions in which people get arrested, perhaps, oh. when, when they are violating, when, when they are found to be in violation of their voluntary self exclusion The idea being that this is, this is fundamentally a program to try to support somebody who is experiencing uh, difficulties, not one of punitive, um, you know, um, um, disincentives, if you will. Um, there, that's, that's an approach that other, other jurisdictions have taken in the past, I should say, are moving away from. And, and in that sort of mindset, um, I think we're left with 
you know, the point that I've been trying to make, which is how can we work together to support the Yeah. If, if I could just expand on that piece, um, that uh, we, we specifically adopted what we were calling an engaged approach to voluntary self-exclusion. That this should not just be a, uh, an administrative function, that this is actually, this is a person that is actively reaching out to, to seek help. And it could be argued that when they violate that agreement and come back to the casino, it is also another point in time which help can be provided. And what I have appreciated is a partnership between the IEB, uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino, um, and our GameSense program, that when this happens, it's also seen as an opportunity to, again, provide a, even a brief intervention that, that perhaps leads to uh, somebody seeking additional support um, outside of the casino. It takes a village. It takes a village, that's right. Very helpful, thanks. It just was a number that just needed a little bit further clarification, so I appreciate that. If I could All just right. tap on one um, other piece, and, and Chair, you mentioned this um, a little bit ago, which was Play My Way, and just the, the um, enormous effort to get that off of the ground um, back in 2014 and 15. Um, and the, the commitment by um, Plain Ridge Park Casino to really take that, own it, and, and see it through to its success. It's, it, it, it was an IT, um, without a doubt it was an IT uh, task, but it was also a, a marketing task. Um, so, you know, both Jason Gittle, Ray Collins, uh, Lisa McKinney, um, it, 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 in collaboration with the Gaming Commission to assure that that, that got off the ground was, was very important. And if I could also add to that, sorry, um, is that uh, this is a great reminder of the work we have yet to do with the other two licensees. It's a different platform. Um, it's a different time frame for, for deploying, uh, some of which, you know, to, to which we have all agreed to, and we need to revisit, uh, uh, you know, given the, the, the COVID closures um, as, as our next to do on the two, two other licenses. And I know that's on, Karen, that's on your work plan for, with Katrina and team. So, and, and the, the marketing and all the other efforts that go on, as Mark says, it really is cross-departmental. So thank you, Mark's team. All righty. Joe, I think, um, I think Mark, we're all set, commissioners, for Director Vanderlinden. All righty. Thank you. Thanks for thank you. a very comprehensive report. Right, Joe. Okay, okay great. Um, so I will be doing the last report uh, for the commission uh, on behalf of the Ombudsman's Office. Um, so the focus of my review is in the areas of RFA 2 compliance, uh, host and surrounding community agreement compliance, and uh, compliance with the Section 61 findings. So as Jill mentioned in her uh, report, you know, in preparation for this relicensing effort um, in 2018 and 2019, we undertook what, what we called a commitments review, which was presented to the commission in February of 2019. That started out as a midterm review, but wound up going a bit beyond ha the halfway point and to maybe the two thirds point. And so we had to come up with a better name for it. And we just called it the uh, commitments review. So my presentation, because so much of that work was done previously, my presentation is largely an update of that earlier effort. So overall, uh, we're very pleased with PPC's compliance over the five-year term. Uh, they've complied with the vast majority of their commitments. You know, most of these had to do with the actual construction of the facility and getting things up and running. Um, but there's also the, the ongoing commitments. Um, you know, and there's nothing in this report that we believe would, uh, would ever disqualify them from receiving a license renewal. Now, with that said, there were a few areas identified where either compliance could not be achieved, or uh, in fact, some areas that, that uh, PPC is still working on. Um, so with respect to the RFA2, we had uh, a few things that were in there. Uh, initially, the RFA2 proposed an on-site daycare facility. 
Um, and early on, that was determined that there was not adequate space to provide that on site. So um, right now, PPC contracts with Care at Work to provide team members with uh, Care.com membership, which is the world's largest uh, network of caregivers um, that care for children. A um, couple of other things under non-gaming amenities. Um, you know, originally, uh, PPC had proposed using the infield of the racetrack for maybe some events. They wanted to do maybe some music or other things there. And when the design was done on that, you know, they needed to put a stormwater detention basin in that area. So they haven't been able to use that space. I guess they have used, uh, had a few events pre-COVID on the apron uh, of the racetrack. So they've been able to sort of comply with wanting to do some outdoor events, but they weren't able to use that infield location. And then the third item was just regarding the food court. Uh, the RFA2 proposed four venues in the food court. And right now there are just three venues there. It's not that there's any empty space. It's just that they're different size from what was originally proposed. So again, we have no real issues with these things. You know, there, there were commitments that were made and they've made alternatives to, to try to address those. Um, with respect to the host and surrounding community agreements, uh, at the time that we did um, that earlier review, um, PPC was still working on a couple of things, notably uh, some donations to charities and some of the surrounding communities. But as of today, uh, we got a recent update of their uh, host and surrounding community agreements updated through August of 2020. And at this point, it appears that they have, that they are in substantial compliance with all of their host and surrounding community agreement requirements. Um, and then on section 61 findings, I think as I mentioned earlier, most of those really related to the actual construction of the facility, but there are a few that, that extend, you know, out into the, to the license term. Um, and there are a couple of those things that are still outstanding. And one I'm gonna talk about is the, the transportation monitoring program. Um, so the MassDOT section 61 findings require there to be an annual traffic study uh, for, for the five year term of, of the license. And, one of those uh, studies actually inadvertently didn't get completed. So PPC is you know, committed to doing that additional study uh, and they were going to do that in June of 2020. Now, obviously COVID intervened and doing a traffic study when the facility is closed doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So in fact, we have asked PPC to hold off on doing that study at this point, because we'd really like to um, consult with MassDOT and see you know, what their thoughts are. You know, We know that sort of what I'll call the ambient traffic, the background traffic, still hasn't come back to where it was pre-COVID. And we know that um, since the reopening, you know, revenues are certainly down a little bit from where they were pre-opening. So I think we want to try to get things back to whatever, I guess I'll call it a new normal level is before we do a tra another traffic study. So we're going to do that consultation. But, but PPC is definitely um, committed to doing that. And they said, you know, Whenever we say go, they'll, they'll do it. Um, and then the other item is uh, our favorite topic of discussion, which was a, a Section 61 finding uh, for PPC to work with the Greater Attleboro Taunton Regional Transit Authority, we call GATRA, uh, to implement a new bus route to the facility. Um, over the last five years, we at MGC, folks at PPC, have talked with GATRA, have talked with MassDOT, we've had numerous conversations that have never really come to a resolution on that. And at this point, I talked with uh, Lance George yesterday and they actually have an announcement to make on this. So I'd like to invite Lance to uh, just come on to uh, explain what's happening with GATRA. Thanks, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We do have a, a positive update to provide. In short, we have reached a verbal agreement with GATRA. The property will be funding a micro transit initiative uh, based on the direction of GATRA. This was their idea, uh, which will provide service in the towns of Plainville, Foxborough, Mansfield, and Rentham. Important connections for the property, including two commuter rail locations in the towns of Mansfield as well as Foxborough. Also significant connections from the existing bus route, Line 14, as well as the Patriot Place and, uh, and the Rentham Outlets. At this point, GATRA is drafting an MOU for review, and the anticipated kickoff date for this service would be October 15th. 
So a very encouraging uh, update down to the wire. I think uh, I think both sides are happy. This makes the most sense uh, for Gatra, um, an existing bus route or a new bus route. I don't think anybody believes is the right idea given what has unfolded over the last six months. We did have lengthy conversations with them about extending the existing bus route. Uh, they proposed this as their best option and alternative. And so we will work with them to wrap up the MOU. The MOU will be good for one year and then we'll revisit. If it's not productive for them or for us, or we would like to transition to a bus route or an extension, we'll make that change. But, uh, we're good at this point. We'll take a look and we can anticipate service rolling out on October 15th. Great, thanks Lance, that's great news. Um, this has been, I guess I would say a thorn in everyone's side, probably from day one of the opening of this facility. Um, so it's great to hear some resolution of that. Um, and again, you know, as I said at the beginning of my report, we, we don't have, uh, you know, any qualms with what's happening here. Everybody's working, you know, the few things that, that are left out there, we don't think are, are critical to the operation of the facility and that, you know, they're working on, on these issues still. Um, so I guess that, that concludes my report. And just before I open it up for questions, I did want to uh, thank uh, specifically uh, Lance George and Lisa McKenney, who have uh, done a whole lot of work on this entire process. And of course, you've heard, and there's also a small army of folks at Plain Ridge uh, Park Casino that have been providing all kinds of input on here. I think you've heard a number of the names mentioned by uh, some of the other MGC folks. Um, you know, there's been We've been meeting for the last two months or so, or close to two months every Tuesday to go over issues, to make sure we have the right documentation, to make sure everybody's talking to the right people and that we're getting all the right information. And it was really, I think, a great partnership in, um, in getting that. Um, I said Lance's folks have been fabulous in getting us information and working with us and you know, doing the back and forth that we need to, to get the answers that we need to get to where we need to be. Um, and, and of course, you heard all of those very uh, detailed, uh, thoughtful uh, presentations by the Gaming Staff Commission. Again, we, we had um, a great group of people working on this. Everybody worked really hard to get to where we are today. And I just want to extend my thanks to everybody um, who was involved and um, made my life a lot easier. But with that, I'll open it up for any questions on this uh, last presentation before we move on to uh, license conditions. Yeah, so the next the next discussion will be on the licensing conditions, but let's just wrap up the presentation and also Lance's update. Questions for Lance or, or Joe? Commissioner Stebbins, are you leaning in? Uh, I am, just to uh, just to echo the, that last bit of news. That is, uh, first of all, thanks Lance and, and, uh, and Joe and the team for helping to resolve that kind of outstanding section, section 61 issue. It was, as it relates to GATRA, but I know as Director Griffin and I have heard, uh, all of the communities have been looking for different ways to connect uh, the uh, increase in service on MBTA lines down to that neck of the woods and finding a way to connect uh, folks to some of the various destinations from the T-stops, as well as think about opportunities for people that live or work closer to Boston that do a reverse commute uh, perhaps out to the uh, the Foxborough Patriot Play Station, and then have uh, hopefully a resource to uh, to get to PPC if they're interested in going to work for PPC. So, uh, congrats, Lance and Joe, and the rest of the team for uh, for helping to make that happen. That's exciting. Other uh, questions, commissioners, comments? Before we move on, oh, and Commissioner Zuniga, were you? Leaning in. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't sure. But let, let me um, let me mention these um, perhaps as a wrap up comment on all the presentations. That um, you know, there's there's a lot of work that certainly happens uh, uh, by by PPC, the staff um, that should get a lot of credit um, for all their efforts. But uh, as I as I was sitting through the presentations and having read the materials beforehand. There's another narrative that really comes across, and that is all the work of the Gaming Commission, all the departments, uh, all, the, all the work that happens uh, on, on a daily basis that doesn't necessarily um, 
get a lot of opportunity to be talked about in, in some of these meetings, except for the, of course, the diligence of looking back at the five years that we are going through today. You know, from uh, as we go back from uh, uh, the responsible gaming framework, all the all the checking that, that gets done on the technology, the revenue reconciliation, the goal tracking, um, the, 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 the incidents uh, daily uh, relative to the GEU and the gaming agents. It's really um, um, a testament to how much work gets done uh, behind the scenes um, that is very relevant to the work that we do as, as regulators today. So thank you to all the team and all the team at PPC, but uh, this is a great um, uh, presentation. So with respect to the presentations, thank you. We're about to go on to conditions and um, a few other items. Commissioners, would you like to take a, a brief break? Um, maybe five, I'm seeing five minutes. Should we do 10, 10 minutes or five minutes? Commissioner O'Brien, how, how's virtual school going today? <laughs> I'm about to find out, so I would say 10. 10 minutes will be great. And, and again, to Commissioner Zuniga, I know that every commissioner will want to have an opportunity to thank um, both our team and PPC. There'll be an opportunity. But again, Commissioner Zuniga, you summed it up. We thank everyone for the thorough reports and presentations at this point. Okay, um, it is now 11.07. Um, we'll return at 11.17. Uh, um, Mr. Grossman, Mr. Demolini will go through the conditions. We'll have an update from PPC, and then um, if we wish to go forward our vote. Thank you very much. 10 minutes, um, we'll be back in 1117. Thank you. I think we can get started then. Um, yeah, I see Todd now, thank you. Um, Joe, I think we're returning now to now item C on the uh, agenda, the um, conditions, please. Yep, okay. Um... So just uh, again, before we get into the meat of the conditions, I just wanted to go through a little bit of the process on how we arrived at our, at our conditions. Um, so first, we started with the original license conditions from five years ago, and we reviewed them to see what items on that list could be removed, uh, you know, essentially because they were completed. So for instance, these, might, these included the preparation of various workforce plans and the tourism plan and some of these other plans that were required, as well as compliance with the actual you know, building plans and specifications and things like that. So we were able to sort of remove all those items uh, from, the, from the license condition. And then second, what we wanted to do was reduce what I'm gonna call the redundancy in the conditions. Um, when the original conditions were developed, uh, a number of our regulations had not yet been written. So we needed to put in a lot of la specific language into the um, conditions that reflected uh, you know, some regulations that may not have been uh, prepared at that point. Of course, now that the regs exist and compliance is just required by those regs, we don't really need to repeat them in the license conditions. So there's a, there, there are a bunch of those that we went through um, and eliminated from, from the license conditions. And then third, uh, we asked all of the uh, MGC staff that were involved in this to, to let us know, uh, and the commissioners in fact, as well, to let us know if there are any new conditions that we felt uh, needed to be added in uh, to these conditions. And uh, there were no suggestions from uh, the commissioners or staff, which I, I think is really um, a testament to the job that uh, PPC has done over the last five years. And um, with that, I'm going to share my screen, which has the uh, draft conditions so that we can just walk through these item by item. Everybody have that up on their screens? Yes, we do. Okay, so um, the, the uh, I'll just walk through these uh, fairly quickly, uh, just one by one, and I'll highlight you know, any of the changes that we, that we made to these. So in the first one, we talk about the compliance with uh, 23K. And but what we did do in here was we added compliance with 23K section 21. And that section 21 is the section of the, the law that 
that sets out the specific conditions that each licensee has to meet. So re again, rather than reprinting them all in the license itself, we just did it by reference. Uh, item number two, and again, if anybody has questions uh, on any of these, uh, please feel free to interrupt as, as I'm going along. Joe, on that note, section, section 21 does have some um, conditions that apply to the original licensing period. Are there any that no longer apply? Is your recollection that all of them apply? Um, no, I think the, these are all, they all seem to be um, operational conditions. Okay. You know, for instance, they talk about CapEx and they talk about some of those other things. Um, and I, I defer to Todd on that. I don't think there was anything in there that's no longer in effect for the facilities. But of course, if, if something related to the construction of it, it would just simply be not applicable to the facility since it was already constructed. Fair enough. Uh, um, so the second item, uh, compliance with all federal state, uh, federal state and local laws, rules and regulations. Um, that's just kind of kind of boilerplate. Um, under item three, we did leave in this requirement for compliance with the host community agreements, surrounding community agreements, ILEVs, lottery agreements. Uh, this is the MOU for tax and child support. And then that MOU uh, between the commission and uh, actually this, this uh, we need to make a change on this. This is the MOU between Penn National Gaming and the Massachusetts Community oh, yes. College Casino Career <laughs> Institute. Thank um, you. So I will make that one, uh, th this is a PDF copy that I have up, so I can't change it in real time, but we'll make that change. Um, and I'm gonna ask Jill, I, I, I can't see her on my screen, but I did see her there. If she can uh, explain why we're keep, originally we talked about getting rid of this condition um, because it was really more effective just during the hiring process and, and doesn't really have as much applicability today. But I know Bruce and Jill had some conversations with some folks that can explain why we need to keep that. Um, it, well, this um, this agreement talks a lot about um, recruitment and training. And the thought is that as um, Plain Ridge ramps up um, regarding their hiring, um, the community colleges and um, and the um, career centers will continue to be um, great resources for them. In terms of the training, um, Plain Ridge Park has um, focused primarily on their own training. Um, but should things change, um, should there be an expansion of um, table games or other um, things that we um, don't foresee right now, um, uh, the community colleges were interested in um, continuing to be um, potential partners um, in this effort. Any questions? Okay, great. Okay, so then uh, the last item, compliance with all federal, state, and local permits and approvals required to construct and operate the gaming establishment. Um, you know, the facility obviously is constructed, but we, we left this in again as a means if, you know, if there's ever an expansion there, if, you know, uh, the legislature approves, you know, table games over there, or they want to put a hotel up or whatever it is, we want to just make sure that uh, we're covered with respect to that. Um, so item number four is um, compliance with the terms and conditions of the following plans and programs subject to amendment as required or allowed by the commission. And we added in this, language subject to amendment as required or allowed by the commission. Um, in the original uh, license, we said, hey, everybody has to prepare these plans. And then there was sort of no requirement to update them. And of course, as we've been reviewing some of the things now, we're realizing, gee, some of these things really are, you know, they're more than five years old and, and really do need to have a, a bit of a refresh. So what this does is this gives the uh, commission the ability to require amendments, you know, as we determine that they might be necessary. And so again, those uh, items that we have covered under here, we talk about the affirmative marketing program for design and construction. And again, this is maybe a little belt and suspenders here. Design and construction is done. 
but we wanted to keep that in play in case there's any expansions in the future um, that they would they would abide by you know an affirmative marketing program for that. Uh, the affirmative marketing program for the provision of goods and services, you know, that's the sort of the standard MBE, WBE, VBE uh, required for, for goods and services. Uh, the affirmative action program uh, for equal opportunity. And then uh, the workforce development plan designed to identify and market employment opportunities to unemployed residents of Massachusetts. And uh, you know what, actually now I'm looking at this, we do have a little redundancy here. This item F, the memorandum of understanding between the commission and Massachusetts Community College Career Institute. We actually put that back down here and made it the right way. The memorandum of understanding between Penn National Gaming and the Massachusetts Casino Career Institute. So I would propose that we delete item F under number three and keep it in under item E number four. Because this, again, this also gives you the authority to require it to be updated from time to time. Um, item five, uh, this is uh, as a holder of a horse racing license, they uh, have to apply with the rules and regulations for horse racing. Um, item number six, compliance with the Regional Tourism Marketing and Hospitality Plan, which shall be subject to approval by an amendment at the discretion of the commission. Uh, we talk about such plan shall be prepared uh, in furtherance of General Law Chapter 23, Section 1-6, and in consultation with the Regional Tourism Council. And I think as you heard from Jill, this item number six and some of these other workforce uh, programs, they're in the process of being updated even as we speak and will be coming in front of the commission in the not too distant future for uh, review and approval. Um, item seven, uh, this was an item that we originally proposed deleting, but we, we, we added back in. Uh, we're saying the licensee shall operate the facility in accordance with lead standards and commit to lead gold certification for any further relevant capital expansions to the facility. Again, we just wanted to be covered in case uh, there's ever a, a, you know, sort of a major expansion that's done for the facility. And then lastly, uh, the gaming licensee shall adhere to the average wage scales provided in the gaming licensee's RFA2 application, and the licensee shall provide annual updates to the commission as required by 205 CMR 139.04. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we tried to get rid of most of these things that we're doing by reference. Um, but we did add this in here just, uh, just to give it some particular emphasis. Wage scales has been a very important, you know, employment and wage scales are a very important part of this whole process. And um, we just wanted to make sure that, I mean, they are required to submit annual reports and they have been, um, but we just wanted to put a little extra added emphasis on it in the, um, in the conditions. So, mm -hmm. With that, that is, that's the entire list of conditions that we're proposing. Um, if anyone has any questions. Um, could, could we keep we the document, on. could we keep the document up while we go through questions, Joe? Sure. Um, Commissioner Zuniga asked about question, uh, condition one, and I know that you uh, suggested Todd might be able to affirm that those are all operational. Uh, just to kind of close this, the loop on that, Todd, is that the case? Yes, I do believe that that's the case. And I would also just uh, note that it also, Section 21, uh, essentially cross-references Section 18, which are the objectives, um, I'm sorry, the evaluation uh, standards that are employed in determining licensure. Uh, and those are covered under 21A1. So those are important too. And as we'll, I think, go through momentarily when the commission talks about um, it, it's findings and relative to this evaluation. Uh, section 18 is incorporated in pretty much everything that the commission heard here today. So that's just uh, an important uh, note as well, that it's really section 21 and 18 um, that are specifically at play here today. Other but questions? Yes, the answer to your question, Commissioner Zuniga, is I, I believe pretty much all of them are still relevant. Fair enough. Okay. Um, other questions for conditions, and we can scroll down as as needed. 
I have one on four, if that's, if there's no one before four, has no question. I just, um, I'm, I'm looking at the language we used for the lead condition. As to 4A, I'm sorry, if we could go back up. Um, <clears throat> there was a good deal of discussion around um, our fabulous construction um, accomplishments that we've already referenced today. Um, for our licensees who had the benefit of of the um, Build a Life campaign and all all of um, what's really was subsequent to that effort. <clears throat> they each licensee and, and PPC assuming a relationship will have an affirmative obligation with respect to capital expenditures, and you address that today. <clears throat> Are you saying that the construction goals? Um, that we discussed today and referenced the other day extensively would apply for uh, capital expenditures and capital improvements here in 4A? If so, do we need to be more explicit like we do in the lead language? Um, so the regulations under 139, mm. 0.04 maybe, I'm trying to do it by memory, um, talk about uh, reporting on workforce for design and construction. And the, in that section of the regulations, they spell out that any construction that is done with gross gaming revenues, meaning essentially meaning CapEx, has to report on workforce. So they would have to do, yeah, so whatever workforce uh, um, levels they provided in that affirmative marketing program, they would have to abide by with the workforce. Now, the other piece of it is the regulations don't require a similar, uh, you know, MBE, WBE, VBE requirement for construction, but one could argue that, that, that construction is a good and service procured by the gaming establishment which requires them to comply with the affirmative marketing program. So I think we're pretty well covered under this. I, I, don't, I don't think we need to be any more specific. I, I, would, actually, I would actually argue to, um, to do away with confusion that we do away with 4A for the reason that, uh, you know, you, 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 you spoke about, uh, Joe, that, um, any future major expansions these would cover. Uh, and my, my thinking on that realm is that if there's any major future expansion, that there will be, of course, the opportunity for a future commission to place any kind of conditions given whatever the set of circumstances led to the expand, to, to such expansion in the first place. So, um, and I know it's, it's, it's fair to think in terms of like, you know, belts and suspenders, but, um, I think it's, it, it, you know, just, just the potential for creating confusion or having, the, let's say, the state auditor come at a future date saying, you know, you're not tracking this gaming commission. And we have explained that this relates to um, a legacy uh, or, or whatever may, may have, um, the, the, you know, an unintended consequence. My, my take is more of kind of like, can we be, as uh, straightforward as, uh, as we as we can with what we have in front of us, clearly what's required in statute, we won't we won't change, um, and that any major changes, expansions, stable games, uh, I don't know that that will be uh, treated accordingly um, with our ability to impose additional conditions. What, why don't we just take the same language that we use for the lead and and apply that so it's clear that this would apply to any. Um, a significant uh, capital expansion construction project. I guess I'm wondering why uh, you're concerned about an audit. Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm saying it's not necessary that any future expansion we treat, uh, at, whenever we get to that point, we will be able to place any kind of conditions um, at, at that time. Um, that placing a condition now predicated on the possibility of a future expansion well, may, generate, may generate some confusion. 
How about if we look at just the language for the lead on the weekend, see what you think on that. Um, well, yeah, it's, I, it's, it's, I think it's similar. It's it's a future capital expansion. Um, but they do have an obligation. They have an ob affirmative obligation to do. Yeah, they're, they, they've so been certified. It's not, as though it's a, it's not an imaginary obligation. It's, no, no, no. They 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 have been certified as uh, lead. Uh, what is it? Silver or gold? They're gold. lead gold. Yeah. They were already certified with what they built as, now, as gold. So see, and then we're committing them to to maintain that for any further relevant capital expansions to the facility. Can't we do the same kind of language for the um, affirmative action program? I'm, 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 I'm coming down on the side of you know doing away with that lead as well, because if there's a future capital expansion, we will have the ability to, you know, to, uh, to, to condition that on you know meeting a lead certificate gold certification but isn't this our opportunity right now too this is what we're doing maybe um if we well, I'm, I'm i'm just suggesting that hypotheticals you know become you know confusing when we're, when we're talking about future um you know that there is uncertain how about other commissioners because i'm i'm just I'm, I'm struggling a little bit as to the wisdom of taking it away um I, I, yes, I um I actually think it's a good idea to leave it in because it just it it we're being very clear about expectations for the future. So you know at the time they don't have to think oh my, what what am I going to be required to do? Um, right now it's here. It's I think it's clear and it's um, you know just it just sets expectations for what the future um, construction. Uh, requirements will be. Yeah, I'm, I'm of the same mind. And also, this is a five year license. And so, sort of, the speculative future is only five years. And you've got um, commissioners sitting here today who will be here for half, if not more, of that time period. So, laying out our expectations, I think, with a little more um, detail to me. Uh, well, I understand Commissioner Zuni's point in terms of if you're yeah. going too far out, maybe when you're renewing a 10-year license, maybe there's a different conversation, but I think at this point it's appropriate to leave it in to indicate, uh, unless there's obviously not consensus around wanting to continue that requirement. But I don't I, think that's fair. I think that is a fair, just that helps a whole lot um, both to both commissioners. Maybe uh, Commissioner Zuniga, that's where I was sort of struggling because it does seem rather, um, it doesn't seem so speculative you know um maybe it is the five year versus a, a, a 15 year license or whatever because i appreciate your idea of that you don't want to uh, tie them to something that's so speculative but to commissioner um camera's point it does help the licensee if it's really going to be a, a planned expectation on our part well let me let me ask because um this is relevant to the lead certification there's um Joe, tell me if, if you can answer this question. My understanding of LEED certification is that, you know, there's one for the construction and there is, there may be another one for the operations. Uh, are we talking about a LEED certification for the operations period? I, I don't think no, we're all. No, you know, there's, um, there, is a, there is an ability to do a recertification under LEED and that is purely optional. It's not like, the lead folks will come back and take away your certification if you don't do that. Um, what I think what we were just saying under this lead was that, you know, the there are operation and maintenance standards under lead that say, you know, they're supposed to do, you know, uh, energy audits and some of these other things. And we just want to, you know, make sure that they're operating in sort of in compliance with those standards. And then that any future uh, expansions that they're committing to uh, continuing that effort that they did in, in the initial construction. Uh, let, let me just mention that uh, you know this is not a, a by any means a deal breaker. I'm, I'm trying to um, to try to simplify it a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't want to create confusion, uh, but but I, I think it's a fair point that others make uh, in terms of um, creating expectations and mentioning what what might be you, you know. Uh, something that we want in the future when others might not be here um 
So uh, I was just trying to simplify uh, some of the attainability of these conditions. I would just add, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, if I may, although I'll slightly straddle the fence on this issue for you, that uh, both of these things are referenced in uh, Chapter 23K, both Section 21 and 18. So in the future, if it were taken out, any commission could easily say, well, here you're required to do this. On the flip side, it may be helpful to keep it in so that it's clear that this is the expectation, that this does apply to any future uh, construction and design. So uh, both ways, I think you're covered. Um, then I'm fine leaving it in. Okay, uh, that that's helpful. Um, I I think with respect to a leap for a as is, um, I'm hearing that at least we know that the goals would apply um, for not just retrospectively for past construction, but for future capital improvements and expansions. Um, other questions for Joe and Todd? Straightforward. Well done, nice and clean and, and, and very helpful. Um, okay, and I, I guess just from a procedural standpoint, Todd, I will ask you, um, so I'm recommending deleting item 3F because it's already covered under item 4E. Would we need a motion to to make an amendment to that? Well, I think. Um, oh, sorry, Madam Chair. If you're, so Go you right ahead. Go right ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I was I was just going to say um, I don't think we need a motion at this point if there's consensus that these are the conditions because I think uh, subsequent to this we'll want to talk about the draft decision, if you will, um, if there is a decision to renew. Um, and which incorporates the conditions. So that would be part of that. Um, but it would be helpful to at least have a consensus that uh, these are essentially the conditions you would like to see. With respect to what uh, Joe is proposing for the edit on this document that um, would be incorporated into, I believe, the, the license if it gets issued, um, there doesn't, I, I, Everybody agrees that that's helpful, correct? I'm not hearing any any objections. So I, I agree, uh, Joe, that you should make that edit. I think we are all agreeing, agreeing to that because it is redundant. Okay. As to, and then I think we've had some discussion as to the conditions. That, um, if there are no other comments or questions, um, can we give, um, I, I don't see everybody right now, so maybe it would be helpful if you, um, yeah. The, uh, then I can get the thumbs ups and I can't look around my shoulders like thumbs up in terms of the um, conditions in terms of a consensus. Great mm -hmm. with that edit. Thank you. We may use okay, that. So, to, so that like. concludes my report on the um, license conditions. Excellent. Now, um, in terms of the next um, piece of information, we did receive word that Penn National does have an update for us uh, that they would like to make before we move on to um, any motion on the uh, renewal of the license. I'd like to introduce uh, to you um, Aaron Chamberlain, who is Senior Vice President, Regional Operations for Penn National. Um, they have a very busy morning. They've got a board meeting, and so she is taking time. I can see her now. She's here and um, we'll have a, an update from Erin. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Executive Director Wells. Thank you for allowing me a brief moment to share an update with you this morning. Um, as you're preparing to vote, we thought it would be best to share this information um, so you had uh, full transparency. As you all know, Lance George has been a really terrific GM for us at Plain Ridge Park over the first five years, um, actually five years plus, um, that Lance has been with us in uh, Boston area. So he's been so terrific that he's actually earned himself a promotion. And we have asked Lance to take on responsibilities as the general manager for our Argosy Riverside um, Casino that's located in Kansas City, Missouri. This is a great opportunity for Lance and well-deserved um, for certain. 
pending all regulatory approvals, we've asked North Groundsel to join the team that Lance has built at Plain Ridge Park as their new general manager. North is currently the assistant general manager for us at our Ameristar Blackhawk property, which is located in Colorado. Um, and he's been with Penn since 2017. However, Jay and I both have known North for going on 15, 16 years now, um, as we both worked with him while we were at East Cedars Entertainment. North has submitted his gaming license um, application, and we look forward to introducing him to you um, in the very near future. Um, of course, Lance and North will partner and work together to ensure we have a very smooth transition. Um, and we anticipate that will occur sometime later this year, pending all licensing and regulatory requirements being met. Um, well, I know this is perhaps not technically a required disclosure prior um, to the vote, we really did want to be sure that we were very transparent with you um, regarding this leadership change before you made such an important decision. Um, so I thank you for the opportunity to share this update. Um, I congratulate Lance, and of course, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Well, first off, Lance is not showing his face right now. Um, and if he's hearing us, we would love to, there we are. Um, Aaron, thank you for the update. I'm going to turn it over to my fellow commissioners for questions to, to you, Aaron. And then um, I know that folks are gonna to wanna to say something to Lance. And then I also am going to invite Loretta Lilios um, to follow up on the news of the successor and the status of, of the, um, the licensing process. So commissioners, who's leaning in first? For questions for Aaron or comments for Lance? Well. Uh, I'll, I'll, thank you. I'll, I'll start with uh, thank you for the update uh, and um, congratulations to Lance. Um, uh, I think uh, we, we got the, the I, I got this update from Aaron earlier um, via phone, and and I got thinking that um, part of the expertise that uh, that we knew uh, Penn National brought when we awarded the first license was this ability to operate in so many jurisdictions, uh, you know, so successfully. Um, I remember when we did the evaluation of the first, uh, you know, at the first time with uh, speaking with our consultants, uh, you know, they made the point, there's little that you're gonna be able to, to say or do or have them do that they haven't already seen in another jurisdiction because they have so much of a footprint in, in, in you know, in the regional casino business in the United States. And, and, and when I learned the news of, of, of uh, Lance uh, leaving, it occurred to me that this is one of the ways in which they are, they are so very able to operate successfully uh, by relying on the ability of their key people to move and, and progress in their careers from one jurisdiction to another. So, um, uh, congratulations to Lance uh, for for uh, you know the work that that he's done in six plus years because I know he came before or during the construction period uh, and in terms of implementing uh, the operations even before it was built um, his team and 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 all the work that uh, that has been done uh, that that we now heard from today in terms of compliance and. And, and, and meeting all the requirements is a big testament to the work that he has been able to do. So uh, we look forward to forward to meeting uh, North, and I know that uh, the team here will also work to smooth the transition with, uh, with them and us. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, I'd like to um, chime in as well. Uh, Vice President Chamberlain, thank you for sharing, and it was nice to, to hear that news. Um, I do want to uh, wish Lance well. Um, he and we all knew that this would happen eventually, I suspect. We knew the company policies and whatnot. So I think Lance will um, miss, you know, I know we, we, got to, we got to him to start to root for some of our Boston teams. So, um, you know, I don't know how quickly he'll, uh, he'll change those allegiances, but at least his kids probably do root for the Boston team. So I do wish him well, and um, he's been a, a, a very good partner, honest with us. I remember when we were scrambling the first time to make sure they were going to receive a license to open, and we had a 4 a.m. meeting with Lance, 
um, which I'm sure he remembers as well, to make sure those final issues were um, were tied down and they were ready to go for that first license. So he's been a really good partner and um, on both the racing and the uh, casino side, and I think that's important. So again, thank you for officially sharing the news. We do look forward to um, the new general manager and we do, I wish Lance well. Thank you. Commissioner Stebbins. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Mr. Chamberlain, for, for joining us this morning. Um, it's been referenced a number of times that uh, um, the great cooperation that we've gotten from your, um, I would call them small, but nimble and experienced team that, uh, that Lance has helped build down at PPC. And we look forward to our continuing work with that team as well as uh, welcoming North to his new position. Um, I think that has made the, the period of this license uh, go very smoothly and, uh, and with a great degree of cooperation. Um, and just a note to Lance, wish him all the best. Um, uh, I told him I had the chance to visit Kansas City about a year ago, so I'm giving him all the best ideas for the best place to get barbecue. Um, and it's no, you know, just a coincidence. I have my Kansas City Royals drinking cup with me this morning, but uh, we will wish him all the best. He certainly will be missed, but uh, as we pointed out this morning, he leaves a, a very experienced, cooperative, nimble, and, uh, and strong team uh, behind to make sure that the Plain Ridge Park continues to be a success in your uh, in your portfolio. So thank you very much for joining us this morning, this afternoon. Commissioner O'Brien. Just to reiterate what's already been said, <clears throat> um, congratulations. I look forward to meeting North. Um, um, Lance, I think it probably speaks to how well things went that I did not have the opportunity to be face to face with him as much as the commissioners who were here in the beginning. Uh, and I trust that the team that is in place, um, like has been said, will carry on the fact that um, they've got a smooth operation and the transition will go smoothly. And Lance, I wish you well. Uh, I wish you, um, as Commissioner Cameron said, I'm sure you're heartbroken to not be around all the New England fans. Um, and I wish you and your family um, good luck with the move. Uh, it's a tough time to do it. So um, I, I wish you well and your family. There's a, there's a lot of benefit in going last um, because everybody has really shared my sentiments. First off to Vice President Chamberlain, Aaron, thank you. You received a, a wonderful promotion. I think it was November or December when we met. So, and then of course we were met with the pandemic. So it's nice to see you virtually. And at some point we look forward to seeing you in real life and working again um, with, with you and your team. As to Lance, um, you know, I've had the benefit of of only about a year and a half working with uh, Lance, but it became very clear to me um, that Lance's gift is he's a straight shooter. There's not a lot of drama. It's clear, uh, he gets things done, and he creates a lovely, lovely workspace. It, um, <clears throat> the testament would be that uh, I visited the, um, the, the property, I guess it was last Friday with Joe uh, Delaney as, as part of our due diligence for today. And um, the property, of course, looked wonderful. But um, our very own Andrew Steffen, who we heard from today, who is the supervising uh, gaming agent there, um, said to me privately he, how much he would miss Lance because he had created, even for the MGC staff, a sense of family. And that's a gift that you've given the folks from our team. And so we thank you for that. Thank you for um, your clarity on your management. And um, we know that, um, you know, when, when there's been a good investment in, by a company into an individual and you spot that, you know that this moment is going to come sooner than later. And, uh, you know, our loss is Kansas City's gain. Uh, I also have the full assurances from um, Aaron that uh, North will be a wonderful addition. Um, and, you know, we just know that because of the collaboration and the great partnership that uh, Penn National and PPC has been, have been for us, um, uh, we, we wish you luck and, and know that we will have, be in good hands going forward. So thank you so, so much. Um, 
So uh, if there are no other questions for Aaron and Lance, I did want to just close the loop with Loretta to just kind of position us because this is an added um, piece of information for us to process as we, as we move possibly into our vote. Uh, sure. So the position, uh, the person that holds uh, this position uh, is required to be licensed under our scheme as a key employee. And I can confirm that Mr. Brownsell has in fact submitted his application materials and the licensing division is now completing its administrative uh, review of his submission. Our protocols call for the IEB to conduct a full background review under the key licensure protocols and 23K also authorizes us to issue a temporary license for this position after a preliminary review. Uh, that temporary license would be valid for a limited period while we perform a key, uh, I'm sorry, perform a full review and that process would be available if timing requires it. Uh, individuals licensed as key employees do not come before the five-member commission panel for approval. Uh, the IEB in conjunction with the licensing division is authorized and does issue key licenses. So this is a long way of saying that Mr. Brownsell's status uh, does not interfere with the relicensing decision that is uh, that's before you today. Uh, so Chair, I hope that addresses the, the um, questions you may have had, but uh, if not, I will uh, try to add to that. It really does just help with clarification at this juncture. Are there any questions for Loretta? I see no. Excellent, great summary. Thank you so much. So I think then, Joe, we, we need to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is in the event that, first off, um, you know, I know our thank yous will come as well, uh, but we have had the benefit of a very comprehensive um, presentation today. The work has been going on for you know, a, a good lengthy period, well before even February when you really ironed out the process for us. Um, you were able to achieve some great efficiencies that helped PPC and helped us, and we um, appreciate that. Today's presentations, I think, um, you know, were very thorough, they were clear, and um, give us really the information that we um, can move ahead as an informed body. But with that said, I do want to make sure that my fellow commissioners feel the same. And if so, um, there would need to be a formal motion to proceed for um, the renewal of the license. <clears throat> In terms of uh, feeling comfortable, can, does it make sense to give a thumbs up or um, are there further questions? I'm, I'm okay. Uh, um, this, 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 it's very thorough and uh, I won't repeat the point I made before. Thank you to everybody for all of their work uh, associated with this. Yes, thank you. Any, um, any uh, additional items that you would want to address or that we need to go back on? Everybody comfortable? Okay, got a, a different lighting effect going on, so I'm having to squint to see you now. Um, excellent. Uh, at this juncture then, I, I am asking for a formal motion if, if one of you wishes to move. Um, Madam Chair, uh, I'd move that the commission renew the Category 2 Gaming License to Plain Ridge Gaming and Redevelopment, LLC, for a term of five years commencing June 24th, 2020, in accordance with the terms and conditions set out in the renewal determination, and as discussed here today, uh, that the Commission has reviewed. Madam Do Chair, I, I, have a, I have a question, a technical question on that motion. Um, I think we prior we, we discussed previously that a renewal of a license would be from the point of the vote, not necessarily June 24th. Is that correct, Todd? Um, no, there's we, been a revision. We that was um, discussed in the past. We went back and took a look at the statute, though, um, and it's right in section 20F. 
it says that um, the category two license issued shall be for a period of five years. Um, and in order to uh, remain in compliance with that section, I would suggest that the, the license has to have effectively ended on June 24th um, and would then be renewed at that time, even though it didn't technically expire because it was continued uh, while we the commission was reviewing the application. That should be the actual date to ensure that it's a five year. Fair enough. I, I just wanted to make sure we didn't have um, a misunderstanding because I remember the prior discussion. And, and Commissioner Zuniga, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I also addressed that question. Um, it's my understanding, uh, team, and maybe uh, Karen, if you want to help clarify uh, that this has been addressed with, um, with Lance and his team. That because I believe the initial letter did reference, as Commissioner Zuniga brought up, um, that the, it would be the date going forward as opposed to the June date. Yes, that is, that is correct, Madam Chair. And uh, the team did circle back with Lance and the uh, team at PPC on that. So we're all in agreement, is my understanding. Commissioner Seneca? On that note, then I would second the motion. Perfect. An, an important clarification, so thank you. Does anybody have any further edits or questions regarding the, the motion before us? All right, then I'll take a roll call vote. And uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero, Shara. And that would be a congratulations to PPC, to Lance George, and their entire team. With that, um, each commissioner, if you want to, if you would um, like to comment, we will have um, um, President and C uh, Chief and Executive Officer CEO Jay Snowden um, does wish to address all of us. So if you would like perhaps to make your any comments now, um, I would invite that we let um, uh, uh, President and Chief uh, Executive Officer Snowden close um, make the, the final statement today. So I would invite you now to make your comments. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, just reiterate, um, thank you to all the team. I see Jay uh, has joined us. Thank you, Jay, for all the work that, uh, that PPC has done, all the work that Penn National does uh, and has brought to uh, to the Commonwealth here with, uh, with the investment six, uh, six and a half years ago and, and the, the five years of operations, um, you know, it's, it's a testament to the, the strength of the company. Uh, and uh, in many ways, uh, the, the, the Commonwealth has benefited because of all of that. So congratulations on this um, new phase. And uh, we look forward to another five years of, of similar smooth operations. If I could, uh, yes, thank you. If I could, uh, I, I, um, I congratulate the team also. Not only were there no disqualifying issues, but there were no, there were no issues at all. It was such a clean report today and um, both teams, I think, worked hard to, to get to this point. Um, President Snowden made us, uh, and I'll always remember this, he made us a, um, um, a commitment when we first issued this license that we that Penn National would be a good partner here in Massachusetts and would always live up to their uh, to their um, to their commitments and I think the uh, public meeting which we had so many people testify how much good has been done for the community um, and what a good partner um, PPC has been is is a testament to to um, that promise and the fact that that promise was kept. So again, congratulations and um, really good work. Thank you. Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, it's interesting is, is we're sitting here when we first reviewed their RFA2 application 
uh, that process was both an opportunity to look at the previous performance of the licensee as well as what their plans would be going forward. And that was uh, really how we based our decision. Um, as we get here today and think about the license renewal, it's, it's that same combination. We have looked at their performance over the past five years and it has been strong. And at the same time, uh, through some of the plans that Director Griffin talked about, we get a little bit of insight into what the next five years will look like also. And I think that's uh, a, a strong acknowledgement of, of the great work that uh, the PPC team has done as well as, uh, as well as Penn National. You know, when we license them as the, the first licensee in the Commonwealth, uh, they immediately struck out to do two things, which was stem the loss of revenue that we knew was going to other gaming jurisdictions, as well as offer some incredible career and work opportunities for Massachusetts residents. Those were the two big components of the Expanded Gaming Act. And um, I think it's, it's, it's been determined that PPC did a great job in helping us meet those objectives of the, uh, of the gaming statute. Uh, the next year, five years, will be exciting. Uh, I think the leadership of the company and the leadership on the ground in, in Plainville will, uh, will continue to help them be successful, not only just with gaming operations, but as Commissioner Cameron always notes, with the, with the horse racing side of the business, I think they have also really helped uh, uh, meet the legislature's expectations as to what could really be possible for horse racing here in the Commonwealth. So um, just kudos all around and uh, a great work by our team to get us uh, to this license renewal decision today and thank everybody for their good work. Commissioner O'Brien. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to reiterate the congratulations to um, the licensee and then also a a thank you to um, our staff, not only the people who presented today, but all the people that helped them <clears throat> gather all the materials to, to get us to where we are. <clears throat> and I do think that this commission benefited from the fact that you have a licensee who complied with the conditions and that there were no surprises. I think that also made the process of doing the first renewal uh, as easy as it could probably be in these circumstances because you could really look at the statute and determine what we as a body wanted to look at. Um, so again, thank you to um, the people of PBC who on un unusual circumstances compiled the information and then in particular to our staff. Uh, and I wish, uh, I wish them luck over the next five years and I hope they keep it going. I'll just echo that and, and extend uh, to you, Jay, congratulations. We um, extend congratulations to your entire team, many of whom are, are joining us virtually today. Uh, <clears throat> I think that I'd like to just share a quick note that we um, experienced when we held the public hearing. One of the um, comments was made by a, apparently a, a candidate for an office that who was not successful. From our perspective, however, that individual is terribly successful because he went door to door um, prior to COVID and um, asked 300 uh, voters a series of questions and each one was asked about what they thought about PPC and this gentleman was able to report back to all of us that there were no negative comments whatsoever that PPC was indeed a neighbor and an economic driver that benefited each and every one of those voters that was a significant piece of due diligence for us and um, uh, note that perhaps he should have been elected given uh, his, uh, um, his work ethic on that piece. <clears throat> you have, um, ex for me, and I know from my fellow commissioners, you've been an extraordinary partner as we've navigated the pandemic. Uh, we um, had two for a sustainable opening, imposed significant restrictions. Your team has been fully compliant with, with those additional conditions on top of everything else that you were expected to do when, back when you were originally received this license. And for that, we are grateful because as I've said before, the stakes are so high right now. So we thank you for that. Um, again, um, I'm so glad you invested so heavily in, in Lance that you're taking him away from us. Um, we wish him well. 
Uh, we look forward to working uh, with North, and I know that our entire team, uh, you know, I wish they could all uh, express their gratitude uh, to Lance because I know that they that you touched each and every one of our team. We're a small group, um, and all the way from the GEU, all the way through the entire enterprise, Lance has made a difference, so thank you. And to that, congratulations, and I suspect, Jay, you'd like to make a statement, and we would welcome it. But, but you're mute. <laughs> that helps, thank you. <laughs> Um, well, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, a couple of things struck me as I listened to the comments. One, uh, I'm getting really old. My, my hairline on video is horrific. And I think that uh, when I first met the commissioners who I've known the longest, Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner Stebbins, Commissioner Zuniga, hairline was better. But um, time flies. Wow. Uh, I think about, you know, six, seven years ago when we were, you know, presenting to you and, and, and really uh, trying to educate around our company and what we stand for, um, our culture and our values and the, the pledges and the promises and commitments that we made throughout that process. And of course, the day we won the license um, five and a half years ago, I remember like it was yesterday sitting there and pins and needles until Commissioner Stebbins with his uh, stone look gave us the final vote after two to two. and. Uh, what a wild ride, but it's been, I'm so proud of the last five years and um, Executive Director Wells, is, you know, I've, I've known her for five and a half years as well and really can't thank uh, your staff enough um, throughout this time frame. It's been a great partnership. I would tell you, I've mentioned this before, it's, it's not the same in every state. Uh, we really value and take serious um, being the first licensee in Massachusetts casino history, uh, the first five year renewal. And um, this is a very important property in our portfolio. It's the only property we have in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, it's my home state. It's a very important state that, um, you know, we wanna make you proud. And um, I'm glad we have for the first five years. I do have to say that we have a board meeting going today. I think um, Chair Judd Stein had mentioned that previously, but I did join Aaron's office in time to hear Commissioner Cameron talk about Lance and what a traitor he is as a fellow Yankee fan, I may have to reconsider his promotion to Kansas. <laughs> he really is now a Boston fan across all sports. His brother's not gonna be happy to hear that. Um, but in all seriousness, we're very proud of Lance. He's done a, a great job. And, and you know, the opening, um, they're not easy. And, and, and you'll recall the, the first week or two after we open rave reviews, but you typically have all of this pent up demand the first few days or the first week, and then it does die off until you stabilize. And we went from being heroes to dogs overnight in the Boston Globe and the media reports. And so uh, Lance is so resilient and um, never complains. And, and I think you guys really summarized him uh, and described him very well, that he's no nonsense, uh, very transparent. You, you get what you always need, which is the truth. And even when the truth is something that we need to self-report, that's what you're gonna get and you're gonna get it real time. That's what we do. Uh, that won't change. I think you're going to find with North, who is somebody that Aaron and I, I know she mentioned, have known for a long time from even pre-Penn days. And then I recruited him to Penn because I think so highly of him. Um, I think you're going to find that he has a lot of those same qualities, uh, obviously different style, uh, but I think that you're really going to like him. Um, so really, you know, just wanted to thank you. I mean, really, it's for us, it's not just about gaming. It's also about horse racing. That's something that we also promised when we uh, we're able to um, earn this license five and a half years ago, and I hope that you're proud of, of what we've done for horse racing in the state of Massachusetts and certainly being the first to open a casino and to do it in a way with integrity and transparency and partnership. And, and I love always hearing you guys describe it that way as well. You have a job to do as regulators. We always respect that, but we can also be partners. And I think in the states where we're at our best, it is viewed also as a partnership um, we will always respect the job you have to do and we will always self-report and we will always um, uh, take criticism and constructive ideas to heart because we want to make you proud. Um, but this is a special day for us and I'm uh, glad to see all of your faces. I wish we could do this in person. Um, it'd be nice to give everybody a hug. But, um, you know, you, you guys have set a really high standard as, as uh, the first regulatory body in Massachusetts gaming history as well. And, you know, we... Um, 
uh, we take that seriously. So I just wanted to thank all of you. I want to thank your staff, obviously thank Lance. Uh, I'll do more of that offline and, and do some embarrassing things for him within the company. And uh, we look forward to welcoming uh, North to Massachusetts. And uh, Aaron will be making those introductions. Hopefully not too distant future, we can do more of that in person. Um, but I'm also uh, available and, and, and free right now for any questions that you may, may have for me, um, whatever, whatever's on your mind, I'm happy to answer. Any questions for Jay, even though I said he could have the last word? <laughs> I think we're all set. Uh, Jay, congratulations, congratulations, PPC. Um, in terms of our work, uh, Todd and uh, Joe, I know we have to finalize their license. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, the vote today memorializes our action. And so um, you'll be uh, getting the written documentation that you need to cement the deal, five years. Uh, it takes a lot of work. It's a short time period, and we appreciate um, all the efforts that went into getting us prepared to make um, an informed decision today. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll continue to make you proud. And then last last comment I would make is, you know, we understand these licenses are, it's, um, it's a privilege. It's not a right. And, and we'll continue to earn that um, every day, every month, every year uh, through the next five years. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, commissioners, we do have a, a meeting at one o'clock um, for our agenda setting. We reversed the order of our meetings today. And um, I suspect we all need to have a little bit of a lunch break. So do I have a motion to adjourn? With, unless there's any other further comments besides a big, I think we can all say thank you team. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all right? Karen? Yes. You'll make sure that that message goes all the way through. Thanks. Absolutely, ma'am. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye, thank you, team. Congratulations, Ben. Thanks. And Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, another big thanks to the entire team, and I vote aye also. Great. Five zero, Shara. Thank you so much, everyone. Great job. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Great job.